Section 6 of Orlando, a Biography by Virginia Woolf. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 4, Part 1 With some of the guineas left from the sale of the tenth pearl of her string, Orlando had bought herself a complete outfit of such clothes as women then wore, and it was in the dress of a young Englishwoman of rank that she now sat on the deck of the enamoured lady. It is a strange fact, but a true one, that up to this moment she had scarcely given her sex a thought. Perhaps the Turkish trousers which she had hitherto worn had done something to distract her thoughts, and the gypsy women, except in one or two important particulars, differ very little from the gypsy men. At any rate, it was not until she felt the coil of skirts about her legs, and the captain offered with the greatest politeness to have an awning spread for her on deck, that she realized with a start the penalties and the privileges of her position. But that start was not of the kind that might have been expected. It was not caused, that is to say, simply and solely by the thought of her chastity and how she could preserve it. In normal circumstances a lovely young woman alone would have thought of nothing else. The whole edifice of female government is based on that foundation stone. Chastity is their jewel, their centerpiece, which they run mad to protect and die when ravished of. But if one has been a man for thirty years or so, and an ambassador into the bargain, if one has held a queen in one's arms and one or two other ladies, if report be true, of less exalted rank, if one has married a Rosina Pepita, and so on, one does not perhaps give such a very great start about that. Orlando's start was of a very complicated kind, and not to be summed up in a trice. Nobody, indeed, ever accused her of being one of those quick wits who run to the end of things in a minute. It took her the entire length of the voyage to moralize out the meaning of her start, and so, at her own pace, we will follow her. Lord, she thought, when she had recovered from her start, stretching herself out at length under her awning, this is a pleasant, lazy way of life, to be sure. But, she thought, giving her legs a kick, these skirts are plaguey things to have about one's heels. Yet the stuff, flowered padwasoy, is the loveliest in the world. Never have I seen my own skin, here she laid her hand on her knee, look to such advantage as now. Could I, however, leap overboard and swim in clothes like these? No. Therefore, I should have to trust to the protection of a blue jacket. Do I object to that? Now, do I? She wondered, here encountering the first knot in the smooth skein of her argument. Dinner came before she had untied it, and then it was the captain himself. Captain Nicholas Benedict Bartolus, a sea captain of distinguished aspect, who did it for her, as he helped her to a slice of corned beef. "'A little of the fat, ma'am?' he asked. "'Let me cut you just the tiniest little slice the size of your fingernail.' At those words a delicious tremor ran through her frame. Birds sang, the torrents rushed. It recalled the feeling of indescribable pleasure with which she had first seen Sasha hundreds of years ago. Then she had pursued, now she fled. Which is the greater ecstasy, the man's or the woman's? And are they not, perhaps, the same? No, she thought, this is the most delicious, thanking the captain, but refusing to refuse, and see him frown. Well, she would, if he wished it, have the very thinnest, smallest shiver in the world. This was the most delicious to yield, and see him smile. 
For nothing, she thought, regaining her couch on deck and continuing the argument, is more heavenly than to resist and to yield, to yield and to resist. Surely it throws the spirit into such a rapture that nothing else can. So that I'm not sure, she continued, that I won't throw myself overboard for the mere pleasure of being rescued by a blue jacket, after all. It must be remembered that she was like a child, entering into possession of a pleasance or a toy cupboard. Her arguments would not commend themselves to mature women who have had the run of it all their lives. But what used we young fellows in the cockpit of the Marie Rose to say about a woman who threw herself overboard for the pleasure of being rescued by a blue jacket? She said, we had a word for them. Ah, I have it. But we must omit that word. It was disrespectful in the extreme and passing strange on a lady's lips. Lord, Lord, she cried again at the conclusion of her thoughts. Must I then begin to respect the opinion of the other sex, however monstrous I think it? If I wear skirts, if I can swim, if I have to be rescued by a blue jacket, by God, she cried, I must. Upon which a gloom fell over her. Candid by nature, and averse to all kinds of equivocation, to tell lies bored her. It seemed to her a roundabout way of going to work. Yet, she reflected, the flowered Padua soy, the pleasure of being rescued by a blue jacket, if these were only to be obtained by roundabout ways, roundabout one must go, she supposed. She remembered how, as a young man, she had insisted that women must be obedient, chaste, scented, and exquisitely appareled. Now I shall have to pay in my own person for those desires, she reflected, for women are not, judging by my own short experience of the sex, obedient, chaste, scented, and exquisitely appareled by nature. They can only attain these graces, without which they may enjoy none of the delights of life, by the most tedious discipline. There's the hairdressing, she thought, that alone will take an hour of my morning. There's looking in the looking-glass another hour. There's staying and lacing. There's washing and powdering. There's changing from silk to lace, and from lace to padua soy and there's being chased year in, year out. Here she tossed her foot impatiently and showed an inch or two of calf. A sailor on the mast who happened to look down at the moment started so violently that he missed his footing and only saved himself by the skin of his teeth. If the sight of my ankles means death to an honest fellow who, no doubt, has a wife and family to support, I must in all humanity keep them covered, Orlando thought. Yet her legs were among her chiefest beauties. And she fell to thinking, what an odd pass we have come to, when all a woman's beauty has to be kept covered, lest a sailor may fall from a masthead. A pox on them, she said, realizing for the first time what, in other circumstances, she would have been taught as a child, that is to say, the sacred responsibilities of womanhood. And that's the last oath I shall ever be able to swear, she thought, once I set foot on English soil. And I shall never be able to crack a man over the head, or tell him he lies in his teeth, or draw my sword and run him through the body, or sit among my peers, or wear a coronet, or walk in procession, or sentence a man to death, or lead an army, or prance down Whitehall on a charger, or wear seventy-two different medals on my breast. All I can do, once I set foot on English soil, is to pour out tea and ask my lords how they like it. Do you take sugar? Do you take cream? And, mincing out the words, she was horrified to perceive how low an opinion she was forming of the other sex, the manly, 
to which it had once been her pride to belong. To fall from a masthead, she thought, because you see a woman's ankles. To dress up like a Guy fox and parade the streets so that women may praise you. To deny a woman teaching lest she may laugh at you. To be the slave of the frailest chit in petticoats, and yet to go about as if you were the lords of creation. Heavens, she thought, what fools they make of us, what fools we are. And here it would seem, from some ambiguity in her terms, that she was censuring both sexes equally, as if she belonged to neither, and indeed, for the time being, she seemed to vacillate. She was man, she was woman, she knew the secrets, shared the weaknesses of each. It was a most bewildering and whirligig state of mind to be in. The comforts of ignorance seemed utterly denied her. She was a feather blown on the gale. Thus it is no great wonder if, as she pitted one sex against the other, and found each alternately full of the most deplorable infirmities, and was not sure to which she belonged. It was no great wonder that she was about to cry out that she would return to Turkey and become a gypsy again, when the anchor fell with a great splash into the sea, the sails came tumbling on deck, and she perceived, so sunk had she been in thought that she had seen nothing for several days, that the ship was anchored off the coast of Italy. The captain at once sent to ask the honour of her company ashore with him in the longboat. When she returned the next morning she stretched herself on her couch under the awning, and arranged her draperies with the greatest decorum about her ankles. "'Ignorant and poor as we are compared with the other sex,' she thought, continuing the sentence which she had left unfinished the other day, "'armored with every weapon as they are, while they debar us even from a knowledge of the alphabet.' And from these opening words, it is plain that something had happened during the night to give her a push towards the female sex, for she was speaking more as a woman speaks than as a man, yet with a sort of content after all. Still, they fall from the masthead. Here she gave a great yawn and fell asleep. When she woke, the ship was sailing before a fair breeze so near the shore that towns on the cliff's edge seemed only kept from slipping into the water by the interposition of some great rock or the twisted roots of some ancient olive tree. The scent of oranges, wafted from a million trees heavy with the fruit, reached her on deck. A score of blue dolphins, twisting their tails, leapt high now and again into the air. Stretching her arms out, arms, she had learnt already, have no such fatal effects as legs. She thanked heaven that she was not prancing down Whitehall on a war-horse, not even sentencing a man to death. Better it is, she thought, to be clothed with poverty and ignorance, which are the dark garments of the female sex, better to leave the rule and discipline of the world to others. Better to be quit of martial ambition, the love of power, and all the other manly desires, if so one can more fully enjoy the most exalted raptures known to the human spirit, which are, she said aloud, as her habit was when deeply moved, contemplation, solitude, love. "'Praise God that I'm a woman,' she cried, and was about to run into the extreme folly than which none is more distressing in woman or man either, of being proud of her sex, when she paused over the singular word, which, for all we can do to put it in its place, has crept in at the end of the last sentence. Love. Love, said Orlando. Instantly, such is its impetuosity. Love took a human shape. Such is its pride. For where other thoughts are content to remain abstract, nothing will satisfy this one but to put on flesh and blood, mantilla and petticoats, hose and jerkin. 
and as all Orlando's loves had been women, now, through the culpable laggardry of the human frame to adapt itself to convention, though she herself was a woman, it was still a woman she loved. And if the consciousness of being of the same sex had any effect at all, it was to quicken and deepen those feelings which she had had as a man. For now a thousand hints and mysteries became plain to her that were then dark. Now the obscurity, which divides the sexes and lets linger innumerable impurities in its gloom, was removed. And if there is anything in what the poet says about truth and beauty, this affection gained in beauty would it lost in falsity. At last, she cried, she knew Sasha as she was. And in the ardor of this discovery, and in the pursuit of all those treasures which were now revealed, she was so rapt and enchanted that it was as if a cannonball had exploded at her ear. When a man's voice said, Permit me, madam, a man's hand raised her to her feet, and the fingers of a man with a three-masted sailing ship tattooed on the middle finger pointed to the horizon. The cliffs of England, ma'am, said the captain. And he raised the hand, which had pointed at the sky, to the salute. Orlando now gave a second start, even more violent than the first. Christ Jesus! she cried. Happily, the sight of her native land, after long absence, excused both start and exclamation, or she would have been hard put to it to explain to Captain Bartolus the raging and conflicting emotions which now boiled within her. How tell him that she, who now trembled on his arm, had been a duke and an ambassador? How explain to him that she, who had been lapped like a lily in folds of paduasoy, had hacked heads off and lain with loose women among treasure sacks in the holds of pirate ships on summer nights when the tulips were abloom and the bees buzzing off whopping old stairs. Not even to herself could she explain the giant start she gave, as the resolute right hand of the sea captain indicated the cliffs of the British islands. To refuse and to yield, she murmured, how delightful! To pursue and to conquer, how august! To perceive and to reason, how sublime! Not one of these words so coupled together seemed to her wrong. Nevertheless, as the chalky cliffs loomed nearer, she felt culpable, dishonored, unchaste, which, for one who had never given the matter a thought, was strange. Closer and closer they drew, till the samphire gatherers, hanging halfway down the cliff, were plain to the naked eye, and watching them she felt, scampering up and down within her, like some derisive ghost who, in another instant, will pick up her skirts and flaunt out of sight, Sasha the Lost, Sasha the memory whose reality she had proved just now so surprisingly. Sasha, she felt, moping and mowing and making all sorts of disrespectful gestures towards the cliffs and the samphire gatherers. And when the sailors began chanting, So goodbye and adieu to you, ladies of Spain, the words echoed in Orlando's sad heart. And she felt that however much landing there meant comfort, meant opulence, meant consequence and state, for she would doubtless pick up some noble prince and reign his consort over half Yorkshire. Still, if it meant conventionality, meant slavery, meant deceit, meant denying her love, fettering her limbs, pursing her lips, and restraining her tongue, then she would turn about with the ship and set sail once more for the gypsies. Among the hurry, of these thoughts, however, there now rose, like a dome of smooth white marble, something which, whether fact or fancy, was so impressive to her fevered imagination that she settled upon it 
as one has seen a swarm of vibrant dragonflies alight with apparent satisfaction upon the glass bell which shelters some tender vegetable. The form of it, by the hazard of fancy, recalled that earliest, most persistent memory, the man with the big forehead in Twitchett's sitting-room, the man who sat writing, or rather looking, but certainly not at her, for he never seemed to see her poised there in all her finery, lovely boy though she must have been, she could not deny it. And whenever she thought of him, the thought spread round it, like the risen moon on turbulent waters, a sheet of silver calm. Now her hand went to her bosom, the other was still in the captain's keeping, where the pages of her poem were hidden safe. It might have been a talisman that she kept there. The distraction of sex, which hers was and what it meant, subsided. She thought now only of the glory of poetry, and the great lines of Marlowe, Shakespeare, Ben Jonson, Milton, began booming and reverberating, as if a golden clapper beat against the golden bell in the cathedral tower which was her mind. The truth was that the image of the marble dome, which her eyes had first discovered so faintly that it suggested a poet's forehead, and thus started a flock of irrelevant ideas, was no figment but a reality, and as the ship advanced down the Thames before a favoring gale, the image, with all its associations, gave place to the truth, and revealed itself as nothing more and nothing less than the dome of a vast cathedral rising among a fretwork of white spires. "'St. Paul's,' said Captain Bartolus, who stood by her side. "'The Tower of London,' he continued. "'Greenwich Hospital, erected in memory of Queen Mary by her husband, his late Majesty William the Third, Westminster Abbey. The Houses of Parliament.' As he spoke, each of these famous buildings rose to view. It was a fine September morning. A myriad of little watercraft plied from bank to bank. Rarely has a gayer or more interesting spectacle presented itself to the gaze of a returned traveler. Orlando hung over the prow, absorbed in wonder. Her eyes had been used too long to savages and nature not to be entranced by these urban glories. That, then, was the dome of St. Paul's, which Mr. Wren had built during her absence. Nearby, a shock of golden hair burst from a pillar. Captain Bartolus was at her side to inform her that that was the monument. There had been a plague and a fire during her absence, he said. Do what she would to restrain them. The tears came to her eyes, until, remembering that it is becoming in a woman to weep, she let them flow. Here, she thought, had been the great carnival. Here, where the waves slapped briskly, had stood the royal pavilion. Here she had first met Sasha. About here, she looked down into the sparkling waters, one had been used to see the frozen bumboat woman with her apples on her lap. All that splendor and corruption was gone. Gone, too, was the dark night, the monstrous downpour, the violent surges of the flood. Here, where yellow icebergs had raced circling with a crew of terror-stricken wretches on top, floated a covey of swans, orgulous, undulant, superb. London itself had completely changed since she had last seen it. Then, she remembered, it had been a huddle of little black beetle-browed houses. The heads of rebels had grinned on pikes at Temple Bar. The cobbled pavements had reeked of garbage and ordure. Now, as the ship sailed past Wapping, she caught glimpses of broad and orderly thoroughfares. Stately coaches drawn by teams of well-fed horses stood at the doors of houses whose bow windows— whose plate glass, whose polished knockers, testified to the wealth and modest dignity of the dwellers within. 
Ladies in flowered silk, she put the captain's glass to her eye, walked on raised footpaths. Citizens in broidered coats took snuff at street corners under lamp posts. She caught sight of a variety of painted signs swinging in the breeze and could form a rapid notion from what was painted on them of the tobacco, of the stuff, of the silk, of the gold, of the silverware, of the gloves, of the perfumes, and of a thousand other articles which were sold within. Nor could she do more, as the ship sailed to its anchorage by London Bridge, than glance at coffee-house windows, where, on balconies, since the weather was fine, a great number of decent citizens sat at ease with china dishes in front of them, clay pipes by their sides, while one among them read from a news sheet and was frequently interrupted by the laughter or the comments of the others. Were these taverns? Were these wits? Were these poets? she asked of Captain Bartolus, who obligingly informed her that even now, if she turned her head a little to the left and looked along the line of his first finger, so, they were passing the cocoa tree, where, yes, there he was, one might see Mr. Addison taking his coffee. The other two gentlemen, there, ma'am, a little to the right of the lamp post, one of them humped, t'other much the same as you or me, were Mr. Dryden and Mr. Pope. The captain must have been mistaken, as a reference to any textbook of literature will show. But the mistake was a kindly one, and so we let it stand. Sad dogs, said the captain, by which he meant that they were papists, but men of parts nonetheless, he added, hurrying aft to superintend the arrangements for landing. Addison, Dryden, Pope, Orlando repeated, as if the words were an incantation. For one moment she saw the high mountains above Brusa. The next, she had set her foot upon her native shore. But now Orlando was to learn how little the most tempestuous flutter of excitement avails against the iron countenance of the law how harder than the stones of London Bridge it is, and than the lips of a cannon more severe. No sooner had she returned to her home in Blackfriars than she was made aware of a succession of Bow Street runners and other grave emissaries from the law courts, that she was a party to three major suits which had been preferred against her during her absence as well as innumerable minor litigations, some arising out of, others depending on, them. The chief charges against her were, one, that she was dead, and therefore could not hold any property whatsoever, two, that she was a woman, which amounts to much the same thing, three, that she was an English duke who had married one Rosina Pepita, a dancer, and had had by her three sons, which sons, now declaring that their father was deceased, claim that all his property descended to them. Such grave charges as these would, of course, take time and money to dispose of. All her estates were put in chancery, and her titles pronounced in abeyance, while the suits were under litigation. Thus it was in a highly ambiguous condition, uncertain whether she was alive or dead, man or woman, duke or nonentity, that she posted down to her country seat, where, pending the legal judgment, she had the law's permission to reside in a state of incognito, or incognita, as the case might turn out to be. It was a fine evening in December when she arrived, and the snow was falling, and the violet shadows were slanting, much as she had seen them from the hilltop at Brusa. The great house lay more like a town than a house, brown and blue, rose and purple, in the snow, with all its chimneys smoking busily as if inspired with a life of their own. She could not restrain a cry as she saw it there tranquil and massive, couched upon the meadows. As the yellow coach entered the park and came bowling along the drive between the trees, 
the red deer raised their heads as if expectantly, and it was observed that instead of showing the timidity natural to their kind, they followed the coach and stood about the courtyard when it drew up. Some tossed their antlers, others pawed the ground as the step was let down and Orlando alighted. One, it is said, actually knelt in the snow before her. She had not time to reach her hand towards the knocker, before both wings of the great door were flung open, and there, with lights and torches held above their heads, were Mrs. Grimsditch, Mr. Dupper, and a whole retinue of servants come to greet her. But the orderly procession was interrupted first by the impetuosity of Canute, the elk-hound, who threw himself with such ardor upon his mistress that he almost knocked her to the ground. Next, by the agitation of Mrs. Grimsditch, who, making as if to curtsy, was overcome with emotion and could do no more than gasp, "'My lord! My lady! My lady! My lord!' until Orlando comforted her with a hearty kiss upon both her cheeks. After that, Mr. Dupper began to read from a parchment, but the dogs barking, the huntsmen winding their horns, and the stags, who had come into the courtyard in the confusion, baying the moon, not much progress was made, and the company dispersed within after crowding about their mistress and testifying in every way to their great joy at her return. No one showed an instant suspicion that Orlando was not the Orlando they had known. If any doubt there was in the human mind, the action of the deer and the dogs would have been enough to dispel it. For the dumb creatures, as is well known, are far better judges both of identity and character than we are. Moreover, said Mrs. Grimsditch over her dish of china tea to Mr. Dupper that night, if her lord was a lady now, she had never seen a lovelier one, nor was there a penny piece to choose between them. One was as well favoured as the other. They were as like as two peaches on one branch, which, said Mrs. Grimsditch, becoming confidential, she had always had her suspicions. Here she nodded her head very mysteriously, which it was no surprise to her. Here she nodded her head very knowingly, and for her part a very great comfort, for what with the towels wanting mending and the curtains in the chaplain's parlour being moth-eaten round the fringes, it was time they had a mistress among them. And some little masters and mistresses to come after her, Mr. Dupper added, being privileged by virtue of his holy office to speak his mind on such delicate matters as these. So while the old servants gossiped in the servants' hall, Orlando took a silver candle in her hand and roamed once more through the halls, the galleries, the courts, the bedrooms. Saw loom down at her again the dark visage of this Lord Keeper, that Lord Chamberlain, among her ancestors. Sat now in this chair of state, now reclined on that canopy of delight, observed the arras, how it swayed watch the huntsman riding and Daphne flying, bathed her hand as she had loved to do as a child in the yellow pool of light which the moonlight made falling through the heraldic leopard in the window, slid along the polished planks of the gallery, the other side of which was rough timber, touched this silk, that satin, fancied the carved dolphin swam, brushed her hair with King James's silver brush, buried her face in the potpourri, which was made as the conqueror had taught them many hundred years ago, and from the same roses, looked at the garden and imagined the sleeping crocuses, the dormant dahlias, saw the frail nymphs gleaming white in the snow and the great yew hedges thick as a house black behind them, saw the orangeries and the giant meddlers. All this she saw, and each sight and sound, rudely as we write it down, filled her heart with such a lust and balm of joy, that at length, tired out, she entered the chapel and sank into the old red armchair in which her ancestors used to hear service. 
There she lit a cheroot, t'was a habit she had brought back from the east, and opened the prayer book. It was a little book bound in velvet, stitched with gold, which had been held by Mary, Queen of Scots, on the scaffold, and the eye of faith could detect a brownish stain said to be made of a drop of the royal blood. But what pious thoughts it roused in Orlando! What evil passions it soothed asleep! Who dare say, seeing that of all communions, this, with the deity, is the most inscrutable. Novelist, poet, historian, all falter with their hand on that door. Nor does the believer himself enlighten us, for is he more ready to die than other people, or more eager to share his goods? Does he not keep as many maids and carriage horses as the rest, and yet with it all holds a faith, he says, which should make goods a vanity and death? desirable. In the Queen's prayer book, along with the blood stain, was also a lock of hair and a crumb of pastry. Orlando now added to these keepsakes a flake of tobacco, and so, reading and smoking, was moved by the humane jumble of them all, the hair, the pastry, the blood stain, the tobacco, to such a mood of contemplation as gave her a reverent air suitable in the circumstances, though she had, it is said, no traffic with the usual god. Nothing, however, can be more arrogant, though nothing is commoner, than to assume that of gods there is only one, and of religions none but the speakers. Orlando, it seemed, had a faith of her own. With all the religious ardor in the world, she now reflected upon her sins and the imperfections that had crept into her spiritual state. The letter S, she reflected, is the serpent in the poet's Eden. Do what she would, there were still too many of these sinful reptiles in the first stanzas of The Oak Tree. But S was nothing, in her opinion, compared with the termination Ing. The present participle is the devil himself, she thought, now that we are in the place for believing in devils. To evade such temptations is the first duty of the poet, she concluded, for as the ear is the antechamber to the soul, poetry can adulterate and destroy more surely than lust or gunpowder. The poet's, then, in the highest office of all, she continued. His words reach where others fall short. A silly song of Shakespeare's has done more for the poor and the wicked than all the preachers and philanthropists in the world. No time, no devotion can be too great, therefore, which makes the vehicle of our message less distorting. We must shape our words till they are the thinnest integument for our thoughts. Thoughts are divine. Thus it is obvious that she was back in the confines of her own religion, which time had only strengthened in her absence, and was rapidly acquiring the intolerance of belief. I am growing up, she thought, taking her taper at last. I am losing some illusions, she said, shutting Queen Mary's book, perhaps to acquire others and she descended among the tombs where the bones of her ancestors lay. But even the bones of her ancestors, Sir Miles, Sir Gervais, and the rest, had lost something of their sanctity, since Rustam el Sadi had waved his hand that night in the Asian mountains. Somehow the fact that only three or four hundred years ago these skeletons had been men with their way to make in the world like any modern upstart, and that they had made it by acquiring houses and offices, garters and ribbons, as any other upstart does, while poets, perhaps, and men of great mind and breeding had preferred the quietude of the country, for which choice they paid the penalty by extreme poverty, and now hawked broadsheets in the strand or herded sheep in the fields, filled her with remorse. She thought of the Egyptian pyramids and what bones lie beneath them as she stood in the crypt, and the vast, 
empty hills which lie above the sea of Marmara seem for the moment a finer dwelling place than this many-roomed mansion in which no bed lacked its quilt and no silver dish its silver cover. I am growing up, she thought, taking her taper. I am losing my illusions, perhaps to acquire new ones. And she paced down the long gallery to her bedroom. It was a disagreeable process and a troublesome but it was interesting, amazingly, she thought, stretching her legs out to her log fire, for no sailor was present, and she reviewed, as if it were an avenue of great edifices, the progress of her own self along her own past. How she had loved sound when she was a boy, and thought the volley of tumultuous syllables from the lips the finest of all poetry. Then, it was the effect of Sasha and her disillusionment, perhaps. Into this high frenzy was let fall some black drop, which turned her rhapsody to sluggishness. Slowly there had opened within her something intricate and many-chambered, which one must take a torch to explore, in prose, not verse. And she remembered how passionately she had studied that doctor at Norwich, Brown, whose book was at her hand, there. She had formed here in solitude, after her affair with Green, or tried to form, for heaven knows these growths are age-long in coming, a spirit capable of resistance. I will write, she had said, what I enjoy writing, and so had scratched out twenty-six volumes. Yet still, for all her travels and adventures and profound thinkings and turnings this way and that, she was only in process of fabrication. What the future might bring, heaven only knew. Change was incessant, and change, perhaps, would never cease. High battlements of thought, habits that had seemed durable as stone, went down like shadows at the touch of another mind, and left a naked sky and fresh stars twinkling in it. Here she went to the window, and in spite of the cold, could not help unlatching it. She leant out into the damp night air. She heard a fox bark in the woods, and the clutter of a pheasant trailing through the branches. She heard the snow slither and flop from the roof to the ground. "'By my life!' she exclaimed. "'This is a thousand times better than Turkey. "'Rustum!' she cried, as if she were arguing with the gypsy. And in this new power of bearing an argument in mind and continuing it with someone who was not there to contradict, she showed again the development of her soul. "'You were wrong. This is better than Turkey. Hair, pastry, tobacco, of what odds and ends we are compounded," she said, thinking of Queen Mary's prayer book. What a phantasmagoria the mind is, and meeting place of dissemblables! At one moment we deplore our birth and state, and aspire to an ascetic exaltation, the next we are overcome by the smell of some old garden path, and weep to hear the thrushes sing. And so, bewildered as usual by the multitude of things which call for explanation and imprint their message without leaving any hint as to their meaning upon the mind, she threw her cheroot out of the window and went to bed. End of Section 6「Section 7 of Orlando, a Biography » by Virginia Woolf. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 4, Part 2 Next morning, in pursuance of these thoughts, she had out her pen and paper and started afresh upon the oak tree. For to have ink and paper in plenty, when one has made do with berries and margins, is a delight not to be conceived. Thus she was now striking out a phrase in the depths of despair, now in the heights of ecstasy writing one in, 
when a shadow darkened the page. She hastily hid her manuscript. As her window gave on to the most central of the courts, as she had given orders that she would see no one, as she knew no one and was herself legally unknown, she was first surprised at the shadow, then indignant at it, then, when she looked up and saw what caused it, overcome with merriment. For it was a familiar shadow, a grotesque shadow, the shadow of no less a personage than the Archduchess Harriet Griselda of Finster Arhorn and Scandop Boom in the Romanian territory. She was loping across the court in her old black riding habit and mantle, as before. Not a hair of her head was changed. This, then, was the woman who had chased her from England. This was the airy of that obscene vulture, this the fatal fowl herself. At the thought that she had fled all the way to Turkey to avoid her seductions, now become excessively flat, Orlando laughed aloud. There was something inexpressibly comic in the sight. She resembled, as Orlando had thought before, nothing so much as a monstrous hare. She had the staring eyes, the lank cheeks, the high headdress of that animal. She stopped now, much as a hare sits erect in the corn when thinking itself unobserved, and stared at Orlando, who stared back at her from the window. After they had stared like this for a certain time, there was nothing for it but to ask her in and soon the two ladies were exchanging compliments while the archduchess struck the snow from her mantle. "'A plague on women,' said Orlando to herself, going to the cupboard to fetch a glass of wine. "'They never leave one a moment's peace. A more ferreting, inquisiting, busybodying set of people don't exist. It was to escape this maypole that I left England, and now—here—' She turned to present the Archduchess with the salver, and, behold, in her place stood a tall gentleman in black. A heap of clothes lay in the fender. She was alone with a man. Recalled thus suddenly to a consciousness of her sex, which she had completely forgotten, and of his, which was now remote enough to be equally upsetting, Orlando felt seized with faintness. "'La!' she cried, putting her hand to her side. "'How you frighten me!' "'Gentle creature!' cried the Archduchess, falling on one knee, and at the same time pressing a cordial to Orlando's lips. "'Forgive me the deceit I have practiced on you.' Orlando sipped the wine, and the Archduke knelt and kissed her hand. "'In short,' They acted the parts of man and woman for ten minutes with great vigor, and then fell into natural discourse. The Archduchess, but she must in future be known as the Archduke, told his story, that he was a man and always had been one, that he had seen a portrait of Orlando and fallen hopelessly in love with him, that to compass his ends he had dressed as a woman and lodged at the baker's shop that he was desolated when he fled to Turkey, that he had heard of her change, and hastened to offer his services. Here he teed and heed intolerably. For to him, said the Archduke Harry, she was and would ever be the pink, the pearl, the perfection of her sex. The three P's would have been more persuasive if they had not been interspersed with tee-hees and ha-has of the strangest kind. "'If this is love,' said Orlando to herself, looking at the Archduke on the other side of the fender, and now from the woman's point of view, there is something highly ridiculous about it. Falling on his knees, the Archduke Harry made the most passionate declaration of his suit. He told her that he had something like twenty million ducats in a strong box at his castle. He had more acres than any nobleman in England. 
The shooting was excellent. He could promise her a mixed bag of ptarmigan and grouse such as no English moor, or Scotch either, could rival. True, the pheasants had suffered from the gape in his absence, and the does had slipped their young, but that could be put right, and would be, with her help, when they lived in Romania together. As he spoke, enormous tears formed in his rather prominent eyes, and ran down the sandy tracks of his long and lanky cheeks. That men cry as frequently and as unreasonably as women, Orlando knew from her own experience as a man. But she was beginning to be aware that women should be shocked when men display emotion in their presence, and so, shocked, she was. The Archduke apologized. He commanded himself sufficiently to say that he would leave her now, but would return on the following day for his answer. That was a Tuesday. He came on Wednesday, he came on Thursday, he came on Friday, and he came on Saturday. It is true that each visit began, continued, or concluded with a declaration of love, but in between there was much room for silence. They sat on either side of the fireplace, and sometimes the Archduke knocked over the fire irons, and Orlando picked them up again. Then the Archduke would bethink him how he had shot an elk in Sweden, and Orlando would ask, was it a very big elk? And the Archduke would say that it was not as big as the reindeer which he had shot in Norway. And Orlando would ask, had he ever shot a tiger? And the Archduke would say he had shot an albatross. And Orlando would say, half hiding her yawn, was an albatross as big as an elephant? and the Archduke would say, something very sensible, no doubt, but Orlando heard it not, for she was looking at her writing-table, out of the window, at the door. Upon which the Archduke would say, I adore you, at the very same moment that Orlando said, Look, it's beginning to rain, at which they were both much embarrassed, and blushed scarlet, and could neither of them think what to say next. Indeed, Orlando was at her wit's end what to talk about, and had she not bethought her of a game called Fly Loo, at which great sums of money can be lost with very little expense of spirit, she would have had to marry him, she supposed, for how else to get rid of him she knew not. By this device, however, and it was a simple one, needing only three lumps of sugar and a sufficiency of flies, the embarrassment of conversation was overcome and the necessity of marriage avoided. For now, the Archduke would bet her five hundred pounds to a tester that a fly would settle on this lump, and not on that. Thus they would have occupation for a whole morning watching the flies, who were naturally sluggish at this season, and often spent an hour or so circling round the ceiling, until, at length, some fine blue bottle made his choice, and the match was won. Many hundreds of pounds changed hands between them at this game, which the Archduke, who was a born gambler, swore was every bit as good as horse-racing, and vowed he could play at it forever. But Orlando soon began to weary. "'What's the good of being a fine young woman in the prime of life?' she asked, "'if I have to pass all my mornings watching blue bottles with an Archduke.' she began to detest the sight of sugar. Flies made her dizzy. Some way out of the difficulty there must be, she supposed, but she was still awkward in the arts of her sex, and as she could no longer knock a man over the head or run him through the body with a rapier, she could think of no better method than this. She caught a blue bottle, gently pressed the life out of it, it was half dead already, or her kindness for the dumb creatures would not have permitted it, and secured it by a drop of gum arabic to a lump of sugar. While the archduke was gazing at the ceiling, she deftly substituted this lump for the one she had laid her money on, and crying, Lulu, declared that she had won her bet. Her reckoning was that the archduke, with all his knowledge of sport and horse-racing, 
would detect the fraud, and, as to cheat at loo is the most heinous of crimes, and men have been banished from the society of mankind to that of apes in the tropics for ever because of it, she calculated that he would be manly enough to refuse to have anything further to do with her. But she misjudged the simplicity of the amiable nobleman. He was no nice judge of flies. A dead fly looked to him much the same as a living one. She played the trick twenty times on him, and he paid her over seventeen thousand two hundred fifty pounds, which is about forty thousand eight hundred eighty-five pounds, six shillings and eight pence, of our own money. Before Orlando cheated so grossly that even he could be deceived no longer. When he realized the truth at last, a painful scene ensued. The archduke rose to his full height. He colored scarlet. Tears rolled down his cheeks one by one. That she had won a fortune from him was nothing. She was welcome to it. That she had deceived him was something. It hurt him to think her capable of it. But that she had cheated at loo was everything. To love a woman who cheated at play was, he said, impossible. Here he broke down completely. Happily, he said, recovering slightly, there were no witnesses. She was, after all, only a woman, he said. In short, he was preparing, in the chivalry of his heart, to forgive her, and had bent to ask her pardon for the violence of his language, when she cut the matter short, as he stooped his proud head, by dropping a small toad between his skin and his shirt. In justice to her, it must be said that she would infinitely have preferred a rapier. Toads are clammy things to conceal about one's person a whole morning. But if rapiers are forbidden, one must have recourse to toads. Moreover, toads and laughter, between them, sometimes do what cold steel cannot. She laughed. The Archduke blushed. She laughed. The Archduke cursed. She laughed. The Archduke slammed the door. Heaven be praised, cried Orlando, still laughing. She heard the sound of chariot wheels driven at a furious pace down the courtyard. She heard them rattle along the road. Fainter and fainter the sound became. Now it faded away altogether. I am alone, said Orlando, aloud, since there was no one to hear. That silence is more profound after noise still wants the confirmation of science. But that loneliness is more apparent directly after one has been made love to, many women would take their oath. As the sound of the Archduke's chariot wheels died away, Orlando felt drawing further from her and further from her an Archduke, she did not mind that, a fortune, she did not mind that, a title, she did not mind that. The safety and circumstance of married life. She did not mind that. But life she heard going from her. And a lover. Life and a lover, she murmured. And, going to her writing table, she dipped her pen in the ink and wrote, Life and a lover. A line which did not scan and made no sense with what went before something about the proper way of dipping sheep to avoid the scab. Reading it over, she blushed and repeated, Life and a lover. Then, laying her pen aside, she went into her bedroom, stood in front of her mirror, and arranged her pearls about her neck. Then, since pearls do not show to advantage against a morning gown of sprigged cotton, she changed to a dove-gray taffeta, thence to one of peach bloom, thence to a wine-colored brocade. Perhaps a dash of powder was needed, and if her hair were disposed, so, about her brow, it might become her. Then she slipped her feet into pointed slippers and drew an emerald ring upon her finger. Now, she said, 
when all was ready, and lit the silver sconces on either side of the mirror. What woman would not have kindled to see what Orlando saw then burning in the snow? For all about the looking-glass were snowy lawns, and she was like a fire, a burning bush, and the candle-flames about her head were silver leaves, or, again, the glass was green water and she was a mermaid, slung with pearls, a siren in a cave, singing so that oarsmen leant from their boats and fell down, down to embrace her. So dark, so bright, so hard, so soft was she, so astonishingly seductive, that it was a thousand pities that there was no one there to put it in plain English and say outright, "'Damn it, madam! Pure loveliness incarnate!' which was the truth. Even Orlando, who had no conceit of her person, knew it. For she smiled the involuntary smile which women smile when their own beauty, which seems not their own, forms like a drop falling or a fountain rising, and confronts them all of a sudden in the glass. This smile she smiled. And then she listened for a moment, and heard only the leaves blowing and the sparrows twittering. And then she sighed, Life, a lover. And then she turned on her heel with extraordinary rapidity, whipped her pearls from her neck, stripped the satins from her back, stood erect in her neat black silk knickerbockers of an ordinary nobleman, and rang the bell. When the servant came, she told him to order a coach and six to be in readiness instantly. She was summoned by urgent affairs to London. Within an hour of the Archduke's departure, off she drove. And as she drove, we may seize the opportunity, since the landscape was of a simple English kind which needs no description, to draw the reader's attention more particularly than we could at the moment to one or two remarks which have slipped in here and there in the course of the narrative. For example, it may have been observed that Orlando hid her manuscripts when interrupted. Next, that she looked long and intently in the glass. And now, as she drove to London, one might notice her starting and suppressing a cry when the horses galloped faster than she liked. Her modesty as to her writing, her vanity as to her person, her fears for her safety, all seemed to hint that what was said a short time ago about there being no change in Orlando the man and Orlando the woman was ceasing to be altogether true. She was becoming a little more modest, as women are, of her brains, and a little more vain, as women are, of her person. Certain susceptibilities were asserting themselves, and others were diminishing. The change of clothes had, some philosophers will say, much to do with it. Vain trifles as they seem. Clothes have, they say, more important offices than merely to keep us warm. They change our view of the world, and the world's view of us. For example, when Captain Bartola saw Orlando's skirt— he had an awning stretched for her immediately, pressed her to take another slice of beef, and invited her to go ashore with him in the longboat. These compliments would certainly not have been paid her, had her skirts, instead of flowing, been cut tight to her legs in the fashion of breeches. And when we are paid compliments, it behoves us to make some return. Orlando curtsied. She complied. She flattered the good man's humors, as she would not have done had his neat breeches been a woman's skirts, and his braided coat a woman's satin bodice. Thus there is much to support the view that it is clothes that wear us, and not we them. We may make them take the mold of arm or breast, but they mold our hearts, our brains, our tongues, to their liking. So, having now worn skirts for a considerable time, a certain change was visible in Orlando which is to be found even in her face. If we compare the picture of Orlando as a man with that of Orlando as a woman, we shall see that though both are undoubtedly one and the same person, 
there are certain changes. The man has his hand free to seize his sword. The woman must use hers to keep the satins from slipping from her shoulders. The man looks the world full in the face as if it were made for his uses and fashioned to his liking. The woman takes a sidelong glance at it, full of subtlety, even of suspicion. Had they both worn the same clothes, it is possible that their outlook might have been the same too. That is the view of some philosophers and wise ones, but on the whole we incline to another. The difference between the sexes is, happily, one of great profundity. Clothes are but a symbol of something hid deep beneath. It was a change in Orlando herself that dictated her choice of a woman's dress and of a woman's sex, and perhaps in this she was only expressing rather more openly than usual, openness indeed was the soul of her nature, something that happens to most people without being thus plainly expressed. For here again we come to a dilemma. Different though the sexes are, they intermix. In every human being a vacillation from one sex to the other takes place, and often it is only the clothes that keep the male or female likeness, while underneath the sex is the very opposite of what it is above. Of the complications and confusions which thus result, everyone has had experience. But here we leave the general question, and note only the odd effect it had in the particular case of Orlando herself. For it was this mixture in her of man and woman, one being uppermost and then the other, that often gave her conduct an unexpected turn. The curious of her own sex would argue how, for example, if Orlando was a woman, did she never take more than ten minutes to dress? And were not her clothes chosen rather at random, and sometimes worn rather shabby? And then they would say still she has none of the formality of a man, or a man's love of power. She is excessively tender-hearted. She could not endure to see a donkey beaten or a kitten drowned. Yet again, they noted, she detested household matters, was up at dawn and out among the fields in summer before the sun had risen. No farmer knew more about the crops than she did. She could drink with the best, and liked games of hazard. She rode well, and drove six horses at a gallop over London Bridge. Yet again, though bold and active as a man, it was remarked that the sight of another in danger brought on the most womanly palpitations. She would burst into tears on slight provocation. She was unversed in geography, found mathematics intolerable, and held some caprices which are more common among women than men, as, for instance, that to travel south is to travel downhill. Whether then Orlando was most man or woman, it is difficult to say, and cannot now be decided, for her coach was now rattling over the cobbles. She had reached her home in the city. The steps were being let down. The iron gates were being opened. She was entering her father's house at Blackfriars, which, though fashion was fast deserting that end of the town, was still a pleasant, roomy mansion, with gardens running down to the river, and a pleasant grove of nut-trees to walk in. Here she took up her lodging, and began instantly to look about her for what she had come in search of, that is to say, life and a lover. About the first there might be some doubt. The second she found without the least difficulty two days after her arrival. It was a Tuesday that she came to town. On Thursday she went for a walk in the mall, as was then the habit of persons of quality. She had not made more than a turn or two of the avenue before she was observed by a little knot of vulgar people who go there to spy upon their betters. As she came past them, a common woman carrying a child at her breast stepped forward, peered familiarly into Orlando's face, and cried out, "'Lock upon us, if it ain't the Lady Orlando!' 
Her companions came crowding round, and Orlando found herself in a moment the center of a mob of staring citizens and tradesmen's wives, all eager to gaze upon the heroine of the celebrated lawsuit. Such was the interest that the case excited in the minds of the common people. She might indeed have found herself gravely discommoded by the pressure of the crowd. She had forgotten that ladies are not supposed to walk in public places alone. Had not a tall gentleman at once stepped forward and offered her the protection of his arm. It was the Archduke. She was overcome with distress and yet with some amusement at the sight. Not only had this magnanimous nobleman forgiven her, but in order to show that he took her levity with the toad in good part, he had procured a jewel made in the shape of that reptile, which he pressed upon her with a repetition of his suit as he handed her to her coach. What with the crowd, what with the duke, what with the jewel? She drove home in the vilest temper imaginable. Was it impossible, then, to go for a walk, without being half suffocated, presented with a toad set in emeralds, and asked in marriage by an archduke? She took a kinder view of the case next day, when she found on her breakfast table half a dozen billets from some of the greatest ladies in the land. Lady Suffolk, Lady Salisbury, Lady Chesterfield, Lady Tavistock and others who reminded her in the politest manner of old alliances between their families and her own, and desired the honour of her acquaintance. Next day, which was a Saturday, many of these great ladies waited on her in person. On Tuesday, about noon, their footmen brought cards of invitation to various routes, dinners, and assemblies in the near future, so that Orlando was launched without delay and with some splash and foam at that, upon the waters of London society. To give a truthful account of London society at that, or indeed at any other time, is beyond the powers of the biographer or the historian. Only those who have little need of the truth and no respect for it, the poets and the novelists, can be trusted to do it. For this is one of the cases where truth does not exist. Nothing exists. The whole thing is a miasma, a mirage, to make our meaning plain. Orlando would come home from one of these routes at three or four in the morning with cheeks like a Christmas tree and eyes like stars. She would untie a lace, pace the room a score of times, untie another lace, stop, and pace the room again. Often the sun would be blazing over Southwark chimneys before she could persuade herself to get into bed. And there she would lie, pitching and tossing, laughing and sighing for an hour or longer, before she slept at last. And what was all this stir about? society. And what had society said or done to throw a reasonable lady into such excitement? In plain language, nothing. Rack her memory as she would, next day Orlando could never remember a single word to magnify into the name something. Lord O had been gallant, Lord A polite, the Marquis of C charming, Mr. M. amusing. But when she tried to recollect in what their gallantry, politeness, charm, or wit had consisted, she was bound to suppose her memory at fault, for she could not name a thing. It was the same always. Nothing remained over the next day, yet the excitement of the moment was intense. Thus we are forced to conclude that society— is one of those brews such as skilled housekeepers serve hot about Christmas time, whose flavor depends upon the proper mixing and stirring of a dozen different ingredients. Take one out, and it is in itself insipid. Take away Lord O, Lord A, Lord C, or Mr. M, and separately each is nothing. Stir them all together, and they combine to give off the most intoxicating of flavors, the most seductive of scents. Yet this intoxication, this seductiveness, entirely evade our analysis. At one and the same time, therefore, 
Society is everything, and society is nothing. Society is the most powerful concoction in the world, and society has no existence whatsoever. Such monsters the poets and the novelists alone can deal with. With such something-nothings their works are stuffed out to prodigious size, and to them, with the best will in the world, we are content to leave it. Following the example of our predecessors, therefore, we will only say that society in the reign of Queen Anne was of unparalleled brilliance. To have the entry there was the aim of every well-bred person. The graces were supreme. Fathers instructed their sons, mothers their daughters. No education was complete for either sex, which did not include the science of deportment, the art of bowing and curtsying, the management of the sword and the fan, the care of the teeth, the conduct of the leg, the flexibility of the knee, the proper methods of entering and leaving the room with a thousand etceteras, such as will immediately suggest themselves to anybody who has himself been in society. Since Orlando had won the praise of Queen Elizabeth for the way she handed a bowl of rose water as a boy, it must be supposed that she was sufficiently expert to pass muster. Yet it is true that there was an absent-mindedness about her which sometimes made her clumsy. She was apt to think of poetry when she should have been thinking of taffeta. Her walk was a little too much of a stride for a woman, perhaps, and her gestures being abrupt might endanger a cup of tea on occasion. Whether this slight disability was enough to counterbalance the splendor of her bearing, or whether she inherited a drop too much of that black humor which ran in the veins of all her race, certain it is that she had not been in the world more than a score of times before she might have been heard to ask herself, had there been anybody but her spaniel Pippin to hear her, "'What the devil is the matter with me?' The occasion was Tuesday, the 16th of June, 1712. She had just returned from a great ball at Arlington House. The dawn was in the sky, and she was pulling off her stockings." "'I don't care if I never meet another soul as long as I live,' cried Orlando, bursting into tears. Lovers she had in plenty, but life, which is, after all, of some importance in its way, escaped her. "'Is this?' she asked, but there was none to answer. "'Is this what people call life?' The spaniel raised her forepaw in token of sympathy." The spaniel licked Orlando with her tongue. Orlando stroked the spaniel with her hand. Orlando kissed the spaniel with her lips. In short, there was the truest sympathy between them that can be between a dog and its mistress, and yet it cannot be denied that the dumbness of animals is a great impediment to the refinements of intercourse. They wag their tails. They bow the front part of the body and elevate the hind. They roll, they jump, they paw, they whine, they bark, they slobber. They have all sorts of ceremonies and artifices of their own, but the whole thing is of no avail, since speak they cannot. Such was her quarrel, she thought, setting the dog gently on to the floor, with the great people at Arlington House. They, too, wag their tails, bow, roll, jump, paw, and slobber, but talk they cannot. "'All these months that I've been out in the world,' said Orlando, pitching one stocking across the room, "'I've heard nothing but what Pippin might have said.' I'm cold, I'm happy, I'm hungry, I've caught a mouse, I've buried a bone, please kiss my nose. And it was not enough. How, in so short a time, she had passed from intoxication to disgust, we will only seek to explain by supposing that this mysterious composition which we call society is nothing absolutely good or bad in itself, but has a spirit in it, volatile but potent which either makes you drunk when you think it, as Orlando thought it, delightful, or gives you a headache when you think it, as Orlando thought it, repulsive. 
that the faculty of speech has much to do with it either way, we take leave to doubt. Often a dumb hour is the most ravishing of all. Brilliant wit can be tedious beyond description. But to the poets we leave it, and so on with our story. Orlando threw the second stocking after the first and went to bed dismally enough, determined that she would forswear society for ever. But again, as it turned out, she was too hasty in coming to her conclusions. For the very next morning she woke to find, among the usual cards of invitation upon her table, one from a certain great lady, the Countess of R. Having determined overnight that she would never go into society again, we can only explain Orlando's behavior— she sent a messenger hot-foot to our house to say that she would attend her ladyship with all the pleasure in the world, by the fact that she was still suffering from the poison of three honeyed words dropped into her ear on the deck of the enamoured lady, by Captain Nicholas Benedict Bartolus as they sailed down the Thames. Addison, Dryden, Pope, he had said, pointing to the cocoa tree and Addison, Dryden, Pope, had shined in her head like an incantation ever since. Who can credit such folly? But so it was. All her experience with Nick Green had taught her nothing. Such names still exercised over her the most powerful fascination. Something perhaps we must believe in, and as Orlando, we have said, had no belief in the usual divinities, she bestowed her credulity upon great men, yet with a distinction. Admirals, soldiers, statesmen moved her not at all. But the very thought of a great writer stirred her to such a pitch of belief that she almost believed him to be invisible. Her instinct was a sound one. One can only believe entirely, perhaps, in what one cannot see. The little glimpse she had of the poets from the deck of the ship was of the nature of a vision. That the cup was china or the gazette paper she doubted. When Lord O. said one day that he had dined with Dryden the night before, she flatly disbelieved him. Now the Lady R.'s reception room had the reputation of being the antechamber to the presence room of genius. It was the place where men and women met to swing censers and chant hymns to the bust of genius in a niche in the wall. Sometimes the god himself vouchsafed his presence for a moment. Intellect alone admitted the suppliant, and nothing, so the report ran, was said inside that was not witty. It was thus with great trepidation that Orlando entered the room. She found a company already assembled in a semicircle round the fire. Lady R., an oldish lady, of dark complexion, with a black lace mantilla on her head, was seated in a great armchair in the centre. Thus, being somewhat deaf, she could control the conversation on both sides of her. On both sides of her sat men and women of the highest distinction. Every man, it was said, had been a prime minister, and every woman, it was whispered, had been the mistress of a king. Certain it is that all were brilliant, and all were famous. Orlando took her seat with a deep reverence in silence. After three hours she curtsied profoundly and left. But what, the reader may ask with some exasperation, happened in between— in three hours such a company must have said the wittiest, the profoundest, the most interesting things in the world, so it would seem indeed. But the fact appears to be that they said nothing. It is a curious characteristic which they share with all the most brilliant societies that the world has known. Old Madame du Dauphin and her friends talked for fifty years without stopping, and of it all, what remains? perhaps three witty sayings, so that we are at liberty to suppose either that nothing was said, 
or that nothing witty was said, or that the fraction of three witty sayings lasted 18,250 nights, which does not leave a liberal allowance of wit for any one of them. The truth would seem to be, if we dare use such a word in such a connection, that all these groups of people lie under an enchantment. The hostess is our modern Sybil. She is a witch who lays her guests under a spell. In this house they think themselves happy, in that witty, in a third profound. It is all an illusion, which is nothing against it, for illusions are the most valuable and necessary of all things, and she who can create one is among the world's greatest benefactors. But as it is notorious that illusions are shattered by conflict with reality, so no real happiness, no real wit, no real profundity are tolerated where the illusion prevails. This serves to explain why Madame du Dauphin said no more than three witty things in the course of fifty years. Had she said more, her circle would have been destroyed. The witticism as it left her lips bowled over the current conversation as a cannonball lays low the violets and the daisies. When she made her famous Mont de Saint-Denis, the very grass was singed. Disillusionment and desolation followed. Not a word was uttered. Spare us another such, for heaven's sake, madame, her friends cried with one accord, and she obeyed. For almost seventeen years she said nothing memorable, and all went well. The beautiful counterpane of illusion lay unbroken on her circle, as it lay unbroken on the circle of Lady R. The guests thought that they were happy, thought that they were witty, thought that they were profound, and, as they thought this, other people thought it still more strongly, and so it got about that nothing was more delightful than one of Lady R.'s assemblies. Everyone envied those who were admitted. Those who were admitted envied themselves because other people envied them, and so there seemed no end to it, except that which we have now to relate. For about the third time Orlando went there a certain incident occurred. She was still under the illusion that she was listening to the most brilliant epigrams in the world, though, as a matter of fact, old General C. was only saying, at some length, how the gout had left his left leg and gone to his right, while Mr. L. interrupted when any proper name was mentioned. R? Oh, I know Billy R. as well as I know myself. S? My dearest friend. T? Stayed with him a fortnight in Yorkshire which, such as the force of illusion, sounded like the wittiest repartee, the most searching comment upon human life, and kept the company in a roar, when the door opened, and a little gentleman entered, whose name Orlando did not catch. Soon a curiously disagreeable sensation came over her. To judge from their faces, the rest began to feel it as well. One gentleman said there was a draught. The Marchioness of C. feared a cat must be under the sofa. It was as if their eyes were being slowly opened after a pleasant dream, and nothing met them but a cheap washstand and a dirty counterpane. It was as if the fumes of some delicious wine were slowly leaving them. Still the general talked, and still Mr. L. remembered but it became more and more apparent how red the general's neck was, how bald Mr. L.'s head was. As for what they said, nothing more tedious and trivial could be imagined. Everybody fidgeted, and those who had fans yawned behind them. At last Lady R. rapped with hers upon the arm of her great chair. Both gentlemen stopped talking. Then the little gentleman said, He said next. He said finally. These sayings are too well known to require repetition, and besides, they are all to be found in his published works. 
here it cannot be denied was true wit, true wisdom, true profundity. The company was thrown into complete dismay. One such saying was bad enough, but three, one after another, on the same evening? No society could survive it. Mr. Pope, said old Lady R., in a voice trembling with sarcastic fury, you are pleased to be witty. Mr. Pope flushed red. Nobody spoke a word. They sat in dead silence some twenty minutes. Then, one by one, they rose and slunk from the room. That they would ever come back after such an experience was doubtful. Link boys could be heard calling their coaches all down South Audley Street. Doors were slammed, and carriages drove off. Orlando found herself near Mr. Pope on the staircase. His lean and misshapen frame was shaken by a variety of emotions. Darts of malice, rage, triumph, wit, and terror, he was shaking like a leaf, shot from his eyes. He looked like some squat reptile set with a burning topaz in its forehead. At the same time, the strangest tempest of emotion seized now upon the luckless Orlando. A disillusionment so complete as that inflicted not an hour ago leaves the mind rocking from side to side. Everything appears ten times more bare and stark than before. It is a moment fraught with the highest danger for the human spirit. Women turn nuns, and men priests in such moments. In such moments rich men sign away their wealth, and happy men cut their throats with carving knives. Orlando would have done all willingly, but there was a rasher thing still for her to do, and this she did. She invited Mr. Pope to come home with her. End of Section 7 Section 8 of Orlando, A Biography by Virginia Woolf This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 4, Part 3 For if it is rash to walk into a lion's den unarmed, rash to navigate the Atlantic in a rowing boat, rash to stand on one foot on the top of St. Paul's, it is still more rash to go home alone with a poet. A poet is Atlantic and lion in one. While one drowns us, the other gnaws us. If we survive the teeth, we succumb to the waves. A man who can destroy illusions is both beast and flood. Illusions are to the soul, what atmosphere is to the earth. Roll up that tender air and the plant dies, the color fades. The earth we walk on is a parched cinder, it is marl we tread, and fiery cobbles scorch our feet. By the truth we are undone. Life is a dream, tis waking that kills us. He who robs us of our dreams robs us of our life. And so on, for six pages, if you will, but the style is tedious and may well be dropped. On this showing, however, Orlando should have been a heap of cinders by the time the chariot drew up at her house in Blackfriars. That she was still flesh and blood, though certainly exhausted, is entirely due to a fact to which we drew attention earlier in the narrative. The less we see, the more we believe. Now, the streets that lie between Mayfair and Blackfriars were, at that time, very imperfectly lit. True, the lighting was a great improvement upon that of the Elizabethan age. Then the benighted traveller had to trust to the stars, or the red flame of some night watchman, to save him from the gravel pits at Park Lane, or the oak woods where swine rootled in the Tottenham Court Road. 
but even so it wanted much of our modern efficiency. Lamp posts lit with oil lamps occurred every two hundred yards or so, but between lay a considerable stretch of pitch darkness. Thus, for ten minutes, Orlando and Mr. Pope would be in blackness, and then for about half a minute again in the light. A very strange state of mind was thus bred in Orlando. As the light faded, she began to feel steal over her the most delicious balm. This is indeed a very great honor for a young woman, to be driving with Mr. Pope, she began to think, looking at the outline of his nose. I am the most blessed of my sex, half an inch from me. Indeed, I feel the knot of his knee ribbons pressing against my thigh, is the greatest wit in Her Majesty's dominions. Future ages will think of us with curiosity, and envy me with fury. Here came the lamp-post again. What a foolish wretch I am, she thought. There is no such thing as fame and glory. Ages to come will never cast a thought on me, or on Mr. Pope either. What's an age, indeed? What are we? And their progress through Berkeley Square seemed the groping of two blind ants, momentarily thrown together without interest or concern in common, across a blackened desert. She shivered. But here again was darkness. Her illusion revived. How noble his brow is, she thought, mistaking a hump on a cushion for Mr. Pope's forehead in the darkness. What a weight of genius lives in it! What wit, wisdom, and truth! What a wealth of all those jewels indeed for which people are ready to barter their lives! Yours is the only light that burns forever. But for you, the human pilgrimage would be performed in utter darkness. Here the coach gave a great lurch as it fell into a rut in Park Lane. Without genius we should be upset and undone most august, most lucid of beams. Thus she was apostrophizing the hump on the cushion when they drove beneath one of the street lamps in Berkeley Square, and she realized her mistake. Mr. Pope had a forehead no bigger than another man's. Wretched man, she thought, how you have deceived me. I took that hump for your forehead. When one sees you plain, how ignoble! How despicable you are, deformed and weakly! There is nothing to venerate in you, much to pity, most to despise." Again they were in darkness, and her anger became modified directly she could see nothing but the poet's knees. "'But it is I that am a wretch,' she reflected, once they were in complete obscurity again. "'For base as you may be, am I not still baser?' It is you who nourish and protect me, you who scare the wild beast, frighten the savage, make me clothes of the silkworm's wool and carpets of the sheep's. If I want to worship, have you not provided me with an image of yourself and set it in the sky? Are not evidences of your care everywhere? How humble, how grateful, how docile should I not be, therefore? Let it be all my joy to serve, honor, and obey you." Here they reached the big lamp post at the corner of what is now Piccadilly Circus. The light blazed in her eyes, and she saw, beside some degraded creatures of her own sex, two wretched pygmies on a stark desert land. Both were naked, solitary, and defenseless. The one was powerless to help the other. Each had enough to do to look after itself. Looking Mr. Pope full in the face, it is equally vain, she thought, for you to think you can protect me, or for me to think I can worship you. The light of truth beats upon us without shadow, and the light of truth is damnably unbecoming to us both. All this time, of course, they went on talking agreeably, as people of birth and education use, about the Queen's temper and the Prime Minister's gout, 
while the coach went from light to darkness, down the hay market, along the strand, up Fleet Street, and reached, at length, her house in Blackfriars. For some time the dark spaces between the lamps had been becoming brighter, and the lamps themselves less bright. That is to say, the sun was rising, and it was in the equable but confused light of a summer's morning, in which everything is seen but nothing is seen distinctly, that they alighted, Mr. Pope handing Orlando from her carriage, and Orlando curtsying Mr. Pope to precede her into her mansion, with the most scrupulous attention to the rights of the graces. From the foregoing passage, however, it must not be supposed that genius, uh, but the disease, is now stamped out in the British Isles, the late Lord Tennyson, it is said, being the last person to suffer from it, is constantly a light, for then we should see everything plain, and perhaps should be scorched to death in the process. Rather, it resembles the lighthouse in its working, which sends one ray and then no more for a time, save that genius is much more capricious in its manifestations, and may flash six or seven beams in quick succession, as Mr. Pope did that night, and then lapse into darkness for a year or for ever. To steer by its beams is therefore impossible, and when the dark spell is on them, men of genius are, it is said, much like other people. It was happy for Orlando, though at first disappointing, that this should be so, for she now began to live much in the company of men of genius, yet after all, they were not much different from other people. Addison, Pope, Swift, proved she found to be fond of tea. They liked arbors, they collected little bits of colored glass, they adored grottoes, rank was not distasteful to them, praise was delightful, they wore plum-colored suits one day, and gray another. Mr. Swift had a fine Malacca cane, Mr. Addison scented his handkerchiefs, Mr. Pope suffered with his head. A piece of gossip did not come amiss, nor were they without their jealousies. We are jotting down a few reflections that came to Orlando Higgledy-Piggledy. At first she was annoyed with herself for noticing such trifles, and kept a book in which to write down their memorable sayings, but the page remained empty. All the same, her spirits revived, and she took to tearing up her cards of invitation to great parties, kept her evenings free, began to look forward to Mr. Pope's visit, to Mr. Addison's, to Mr. Swift's, and so on, and so on. If the reader will here refer to The Rape of the Lock, to The Spectator, to Gulliver's Travels, he will understand precisely what these mysterious words may mean. Indeed, biographers and critics might save themselves all their labors if readers would only take this advice. For when we read, Whether the nymph shall break Diana's law, or some frail china jar receive a flaw, or stain her honor or her new brocade, forget her prayers or miss a masquerade, or lose her heart or necklace at a ball, we know, as if we heard him, how Mr. Pope's tongue flickered like a lizard's, how his eyes flashed, how his hand trembled, how he loved, how he lied, how he suffered. In short, every secret of a writer's soul, every experience of his life, every quality of his mind, is written large in his works. Yet we require critics to explain the one, and biographers to expound the other. That time hangs heavy on people's hands is the only explanation of the monstrous growth. So, now that we have read a line or two of The Rape of the Lock, we know exactly why Orlando was so much amused, and so much frightened, and so very bright-cheeked and bright-eyed that afternoon. Mrs. Nellie then knocked at the door to say that Mr. Addison waited on her ladyship, at this Mr. Pope got up with a wry smile, made his congee, and limped off. In came Mr. Addison. Let us, as he takes his seat, 
read the following passage from The Spectator. I consider woman as a beautiful, romantic animal that may be adorned with furs and feathers, pearls and diamonds, oars and silks. The lynx shall cast its skin at her feet to make her a tippet. The peacock, parrot, and swan shall pay contributions to her muff. The sea shall be searched for shells and the rocks for gems, and every part of nature furnish out its share towards the embellishment of a creature that is the most consummate work of it. All this I shall indulge them in. But as for the petticoat I have been speaking of, I neither can nor will allow it. We hold that gentleman, cocked hat and all, in the hollow of our hands. Look once more into the crystal. Is he not clear to the very wrinkle in his stocking? Does not every ripple and curve of his wit lie exposed before us? And his benignity, and his timidity, and his urbanity, and the fact that he would marry a countess, and die very respectably in the end. All is clear. And when Mr. Addison has said his say, there is a terrific rap at the door, and Mr. Swift, who had these arbitrary ways with him, walks in unannounced. One moment. Where is Gulliver's Travels? Here it is. Let us read a passage from the voyage to the Huynhams. I enjoyed perfect health of body and tranquillity of mind. I did not find the treachery or inconstancy of a friend, nor the injuries of a secret or open enemy. I had no occasion of bribing, flattering, or pimping, to procure the favor of any great man or of his minion. I wanted no fence against fraud or oppression. Here was neither physician to destroy my body, nor lawyer to ruin my fortune, no informer to watch my words and actions, or forge accusations against me for hire. Here were no gibers, censurers, backbiters, pickpockets, highwaymen, housebreakers, attorneys, bawds, buffoons, gamesters, politicians, wits, splenetic, tedious talkers. But stop, stop your iron pelt of words, lest you flay us alive and yourself too. Nothing can be plainer than that violent man. He is so coarse and yet so clean, so brutal yet so kind, scorns the whole world, yet talks baby language to a girl, and will die, can we doubt it, in a madhouse. So Orlando poured out tea for them all, and sometimes, when the weather was fine, she carried them down to the country with her, and feasted them royally in the round parlor, which she had hung with their pictures all in a circle, so that Mr. Pope could not say that Mr. Addison came before him or the other way about. They were very witty, too, but their wit is all in their books, and taught her the most important part of style, which is the natural run of the voice in speaking, a quality which none that has not heard it can imitate, not green even, with all his skill. For it is born of the air, and breaks like a wave on the furniture, and rolls and fades away, and is never to be recaptured, least of all by those who prick up their ears half a century later and try. They taught her this merely by the cadence of their voices in speech, so that her style changed somewhat, and she wrote some very pleasant, witty verses and characters in prose. And so she lavished her wine on them, and put banknotes, which they took very kindly, beneath their plates at dinner, and accepted their dedications, and thought herself highly honored by the exchange. Thus time ran on, and Orlando could often be heard saying to herself with an emphasis which might, perhaps, make the hearer a little suspicious, "'Upon my soul, what a life this is!' for she was still in search of that commodity. But circumstances soon forced her to consider the matter more narrowly. One day she was pouring out tea for Mr. Pope, while, as any one can tell from the verses quoted above, he sat very bright-eyed, observant, and all crumpled up in a chair by her side. "'Lord!' 
she thought, as she raised the sugar tongs. How women in ages to come will envy me! And yet, she paused, for Mr. Pope needed her attention. And yet, let us finish her thought for her. When anybody says, How future ages will envy me! It is safe to say that they are extremely uneasy at the present moment. Was this life quite so exciting, quite so flattering, quite so glorious as it sounds when the memoir writer has done his work upon it? For one thing, Orlando had a positive hatred of tea. For another, the intellect, divine as it is and all worshipful, has a habit of lodging in the most seedy of carcasses, and often, alas, acts the cannibal among the other faculties, so that often, where the mind is biggest, the heart, the senses, magnanimity, charity, tolerance, kindliness, and the rest of them, scarcely have room to breathe. Then the high opinion poets have of themselves, then the low one they have of others, then the enmities, injuries, envies, and repartees in which they are constantly engaged, then the volubility with which they impart them, then the rapacity with which they demand sympathy for them. All this, one may whisper, lest the wits may overhear us, makes pouring out tea a more precarious and indeed arduous occupation than is generally allowed. Added to which, we whisper again, lest the women may overhear us, there is a little secret which men share among them. Lord Chesterfield whispered it to his son with strict injunctions to secrecy. Women are but children of a larger growth. A man of sense only trifles with them, plays with them, humors and flatters them which, since children always hear what they are not meant to, and sometimes even grow up, may have somehow leaked out, so that the whole ceremony of pouring out tea is a curious one. A woman knows very well that, though a wit sends her his poems, phrases her judgment, solicits her criticism, and drinks her tea, this by no means signifies that he respects her opinions, admires her understanding, or will refuse, though the rapier is denied him, to run her through the body with his pen. All this, we say, whisper it as low as we can, may have leaked out by now, so that even with the cream jug suspended and the sugar tongs distended, the ladies may fidget a little, look out of the window a little, yawn a little, and so let the sugar fall with a great plop, as Orlando did now, into Mr. Pope's tea. Never was any mortal so ready to suspect an insult, or so quick to avenge one, as Mr. Pope. He turned to Orlando, and presented her instantly with the rough draft of a certain famous line in the Characters of Women. Much polish was afterwards bestowed on it, but even in the original it was striking enough. Orlando received it with a curtsy. Mr. Pope left her with a bow. Orlando, to cool her cheeks, for really she felt as if the little man had struck her, strolled in the nut grove at the bottom of the garden. Soon the cool breezes did their work. To her amazement, she found that she was hugely relieved to find herself alone. She watched the merry boatloads rowing up the river. No doubt, the sight put her in mind of one or two incidents in her past life. She sat herself down in profound meditation beneath a willow tree. There she sat till the stars were in the sky. Then she rose, turned, and went into the house where she sought her bedroom, and locked the door. Now she opened a cupboard in which hung still many of the clothes she had worn as a young man of fashion, and from among them she chose a black velvet suit richly trimmed with Venetian lace. It was a little out of fashion indeed, but it fitted her to perfection, and dressed in it she looked the very figure of a noble lord. She took a turn or two before the mirror to make sure that her petticoats had not lost her the freedom of her legs, 
and then let herself secretly out of doors. It was a fine night early in April. A myriad stars mingling with the light of a sickle moon, which again was enforced by the street lamps, made a light infinitely becoming to the human countenance and to the architecture of Mr. Wren. Everything appeared in its tenderest form, yet, just as it seemed on the point of dissolution, some drop of silver sharpened it to animation. Thus it was that talk should be, thought Orlando, indulging in foolish reverie, that society should be, that friendship should be, that love should be. For, heaven knows why, just as we have lost faith in human intercourse, some random collocation of barns and trees, or a haystack and a wagon, presents us with so perfect a symbol of what is unattainable that we begin the search again. She entered Leicester Square as she made these observations. The buildings had an airy yet formal symmetry, not theirs by day. The canopy of the sky seemed most dexterously washed in to fill up the outline of roof and chimney. A young woman, who sat dejectedly with one arm drooping by her side, the other reposing in her lap, on a seat beneath a plane tree in the middle of the square, seemed the very figure of grace, simplicity, and desolation. Orlando swept her hat off to her in the manner of a gallant paying his addresses to a lady of fashion in a public place. The young woman raised her head. It was of the most exquisite shapeliness. The young woman raised her eyes. Orlando saw them to be of a luster such as is sometimes seen on teapots, but rarely in a human face. Through this silver glaze the girl looked up at him, for a man he was to her, appealing, hoping, trembling, fearing. She rose. She accepted his arm. For, need we stress the point, she was of the tribe which nightly burnishes their wares and sets them in order on the common counter to wait the highest bidder. She led Orlando to the room in Gerard Street, which was her lodging. To feel her hanging lightly, yet like a suppliant, on her arm, roused in Orlando all the feelings which become a man. She looked, she felt, she talked like one. Yet, having been so lately a woman herself, she suspected that the girl's timidity and her hesitating answers and the very fumbling with the key in the latch and the fold of her cloak and the droop of her wrists were all put on to gratify her masculinity. Upstairs they went, and the pains which the poor creature had been at to decorate her room and hide the fact that she had no other deceived Orlando not a moment. The deception roused her scorn, the truth roused her pity. One thing showing through the other bred the oddest assortment of feeling, so that she did not know whether to laugh or to cry. Meanwhile, Nell, as the girl called herself, unbuttoned her gloves, carefully concealed the left-hand thumb which wanted mending, then drew behind a screen where perhaps she rouged her cheeks, arranged her clothes, fixed a new kerchief round her neck, all the time prattling as women do to amuse her lover, though Orlando could have sworn from the tone of her voice that her thoughts were elsewhere. When all was ready, out she came, prepared, but here Orlando could stand it no longer. In the strangest torment of anger, merriment, and pity, she flung off all disguise and admitted herself a woman. At this, Nell burst into such a roar of laughter as might have been heard across the way. "'Well, my dear,' she said when she had somewhat recovered, "'I'm by no means sorry to hear it, for the plain dunstable of the matter is—' 
and it was remarkable how soon, on discovering that they were of the same sex, her manner changed, and she dropped her plaintive, appealing ways. The plain dunstable of the matter is that I'm not in the mood for the society of the other sex to-night. Indeed, I'm in the devil of a fix. Whereupon, drawing up the fire and stirring a bowl of punch, she told Orlando the whole story of her life. Since it is Orlando's life that engages us at present, we need not relate the adventures of the other lady. But it is certain that Orlando had never known the hours speed faster or more merrily, though Mistress Nell had not a particle of wit about her. And when the name of Mr. Pope came up in talk, asked innocently if he were connected with the peruke-maker of that name in German Street. Yet, to Orlando, such is the charm of ease and the seduction of beauty. This poor girl's talk, larded though it was with the commonest expressions of the street corners, tasted like wine after the fine phrases she had been used to, and she was forced to the conclusion that there was something in the sneer of Mr. Pope, in the condescension of Mr. Addison and in the secret of Lord Chesterfield, which took away her relish for the society of wits, deeply though she must continue to respect their works. These poor creatures, she ascertained, for Nell brought Prue, and Prue Kitty, and Kitty Rose, had a society of their own of which they now elected her a member. Each would tell the story of the adventures which had landed her in her present way of life. Several were the natural daughters of earls, and one was a good deal nearer than she should have been to the king's person. None was too wretched or too poor but to have some ring or handkerchief in her pocket which stood her in lieu of pedigree. So they would draw round the punch-bowl, which Orlando made it her business to furnish generously, and many were the fine tales they told and many the amusing observations they made, for it cannot be denied that when women get together, but hissed, they are always careful to see that the doors are shut, and that not a word of it gets into print. All they desire is, but hissed again, is that not a man's step on the stair? All they desire, we were about to say, when the gentleman took the very words out of our mouths. "'Women have no desires,' says this gentleman, coming into Nell's parlour, "'only affectations. "'Without desires,' she has served him, and he is gone, "'their conversation cannot be of the slightest interest to anyone. "'It is well known,' says Mr. S. W., "'that when they lack the stimulus of the other sex, "'women can find nothing to say to each other.' When they are alone, they do not talk, they scratch. And since they cannot talk together, and scratching cannot continue without interruption, and it is well known, Mr. T. R. has proved it, that women are incapable of any feeling of affection for their own sex, and hold each other in the greatest aversion, what can we suppose that women do when they seek out each other's society? As that is not a question that can engage the attention of a sensible man, let us, who enjoy the immunity of all biographers and historians from any sex whatever, pass it over, and merely state that Orlando professed great enjoyment in the society of her own sex, and leave it to the gentlemen to prove, as they are very fond of doing, that this is impossible. But to give an exact and particular account of Orlando's life at this time becomes more and more out of the question. As we peer and grope in the ill-lit, ill-paved, ill-ventilated courtyards that lay about Gerard Street and Drury Lane at that time, we seem now to catch sight of her and then again to lose it. What makes the task of identification still more difficult? is that she found it convenient at this time to change frequently from one set of clothes to another. Thus she often occurs in contemporary memoirs as Lord so-and-so, 
who was in fact her cousin, her bounty is ascribed to him, and it is he who is said to have written the poems that were really hers. She had, it seems, no difficulty in sustaining the different parts, for her sex change far more frequently than those who have worn only one set of clothing can conceive nor can there be any doubt that she reaped a twofold harvest by this device. The pleasures of life were increased, and its experiences multiplied. From the probity of breeches she turned to the seductiveness of petticoats, and enjoyed the love of both sexes equally. So then one may sketch her spending her morning in a china robe of ambiguous gender among her books, then, receiving a client or two, for she had many scores of suppliants, in the same garment, then she would take a turn in the garden and clip the nut-trees, for which knee-breeches were convenient. Then she would change into a flowered taffeta, which best suited a drive to Richmond, and a proposal of marriage from some great nobleman, and so back again to town where she would don a snuff-colored gown like a lawyer's, and visit the courts to hear how her cases were doing. For her fortune was wasting hourly, and the suits seemed no nearer consummation than they had been a hundred years ago, and so, finally, when night came, she would more often than not become a nobleman complete from head to toe, and walk the streets in search of adventure." Returning from some of these junketings, of which there were many stories told at the time, as that she had fought a duel, served on one of the king's ships as a captain, was seen to dance naked on a balcony, and fled with a certain lady to the low countries where the lady's husband followed them, but of the truth or otherwise of these stories we express no opinion. Returning from whatever her occupation may have been, she made a point, sometimes, of passing beneath the windows of a coffee-house, where she could see the wits without being seen, and thus could fancy from their gestures what wise, witty, or spiteful things they were saying, without hearing a word of them, which was perhaps an advantage. And once she stood half an hour watching three shadows on the blind drinking tea together in a house in Bolt Court. Never was any play so absorbing. She wanted to cry out, Bravo! Bravo! For to be sure what a fine drama it was, what a page torn from the thickest volume of human life. There was the little shadow with the pouting lips, fidgeting this way and that on his chair, uneasy, petulant, officious. There was the bent female shadow, crooking a finger in the cup to feel how deep the tea was, for she was blind. And there was the Roman-looking, rolling shadow in the big armchair, he who twisted his fingers so oddly, and jerked his head from side to side, and swallowed down the tea in such vast gulps. Dr. Johnson, Mr. Boswell, and Mrs. Williams, those were the shadow's names. So absorbed was she in the sight, that she forgot to think how other ages would have envied her, though it seems probable that on this occasion they would. She was content to gaze and gaze. At length Mr. Boswell rose. He saluted the old woman with tart asperity. But with what humility did he not abase himself before the great rolling shadow, who now rose to its full height, and, rocking somewhat as he stood there, rolled out the most magnificent phrases that have ever left human lips. So Orlando thought them, though she never heard a word that any of the three shadows said, as they sat there drinking tea. At length she came home one night after one of these saunterings, and mounted to her bedroom. She took off her laced coat and stood there in shirt and breeches, looking out of the window. There was something stirring in the air which forbade her to go to bed. A white haze lay over the town, for it was a frosty night in midwinter, and a magnificent vista lay all round her. 
She could see St. Paul's, the Tower, Westminster Abbey, with all the spires and domes of the city churches, the smooth bulk of its banks, the opulent and ample curves of its halls and meeting places. On the north rose the smooth, shorn heights of Hampstead, and in the west the streets and squares of Mayfair shone out in one clear radiance. Upon this serene and orderly prospect the stars looked down, glittering, positive, hard, from a cloudless sky. In the extreme clearness of the atmosphere, the line of every roof, the cowl of every chimney, was perceptible. Even the cobbles in the street showed distinct one from another, and Orlando could not help comparing this orderly scene with the irregular and huddled purlieus which had been the city of London in the reign of Queen Elizabeth. Then, she remembered, the city, if such one could call it, lay crowded, a mere huddle and conglomeration of houses, under her windows at Blackfriars. The stars reflected themselves in deep pits of stagnant water, which lay in the middle of the streets. A black shadow at the corner where the wine-shop used to stand was, as likely as not, the corpse of a murdered man. She could remember the cries of many a one wounded in such night rawlings when she was a little boy, held to the diamond-paned window in her nurse's arms. Troops of ruffians, men and women, unspeakably interlaced, lurched down the streets, trolling out wild songs with jewels flashing in their ears and knives gleaming in their fists. On such a night as this, the impermeable tangle of the forests on Highgate and Hampstead would be outlined, writhing in contorted intricacy against the sky. Here and there, on one of the hills which rose above London, was a stark gallows tree, with a corpse nailed to rot or parch on its cross. For danger and insecurity, lust and violence, poetry and filth, swarmed over the tortuous Elizabethan highways, and buzzed and stank. Orlando could remember, even now, the smell of them on a hot night, in the little rooms and narrow pathways of the city. Now, she leant out of her window, all was light, order, and serenity. There was the faint rattle of a coach on the cobbles. She heard the faraway cry of the night watchman. Just twelve o'clock on a frosty morning. No sooner had the words left his lips than the first stroke of midnight sounded. Orlando then, for the first time, noticed a small cloud gathered behind the dome of St. Paul's. As the stroke sounded, the cloud increased, and she saw it darken and spread with extraordinary speed. At the same time, a light breeze rose, and by the time the sixth stroke of midnight had struck, the whole of the eastern sky was covered with an irregular moving darkness, though the sky to the west and north stayed clear as ever. Then the cloud spread north. Height upon height above the city was engulfed by it. Only Mayfair, with all its lights, burnt more brilliantly than ever, by contrast. With the eighth stroke, some hurrying tatters of cloud sprawled over Piccadilly, they seemed to mass themselves and to advance with extraordinary rapidity towards the west end. As the ninth, tenth, and eleventh strokes struck, a huge blackness sprawled over the whole of London. With the twelfth stroke of midnight, the darkness was complete. A turbulent welter of cloud covered the city. All was dark, all was doubt, all was confusion. The eighteenth century was over. The nineteenth century had begun. End of Section 8 Section 9 of Orlando, A Biography 
by Virginia Woolf. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 5 This great cloud which hung not only over London, but over the whole of the British Isles on the first day of the nineteenth century, stayed, or rather did not stay, for it was buffeted about constantly by blustering gales, long enough to have extraordinary consequences upon those who lived beneath its shadow. A change seemed to have come over the climate of England. Rain fell frequently, but only in fitful gusts, which were no sooner over than they began again. The sun shone, of course, but it was so girt about with clouds, and the air was so saturated with water, that its beams were discolored, and purples, oranges, and reds of a dull sort took the place of the more positive landscapes of the eighteenth century. Under this bruised and sullen canopy, the green of the cabbages was less intense, and the white of the snow was muddied. But what was worse, damp now began to make its way into every house, damp, which is the most insidious of all enemies, for while the sun can be shut out by blinds, and the frost roasted by a hot fire, damp steals in while we sleep. Damp is silent, imperceptible, ubiquitous. Damp swells the wood, furs the kettle, rusts the iron, rots the stone. So gradual is the process that it is not until we pick up some chests of drawers or coal scuttle, and the whole thing drops to pieces in our hands, that we suspect even that the disease is at work. Thus, stealthily and imperceptibly, none marking the exact day or hour of the change, the constitution of England was altered, and nobody knew it. Everywhere the effects were felt. The hardy country gentleman, who had sat down gladly to a meal of ale and beef in a room designed, perhaps by the brothers Adam, with classic dignity, now felt chilly. Rugs appeared, beards were grown, and trousers fastened tight under the instep. The chill which he felt in his legs he soon transferred to his house. Furniture was muffled, walls and tables were covered too. Then. A change of diet became essential. The muffin was invented, and the crumpet. Coffee supplanted the after-dinner port, and, as coffee led to a drawing-room in which to drink it, and a drawing-room to glass cases, and glass cases to artificial flowers, and artificial flowers to mantelpieces, and mantelpieces to pianofortes, and pianofortes to drawing-room ballads, and drawing-room ballads, skipping a stage or two, to innumerable little dogs, mats, and antimacassars, the home, which had become extremely important, was completely altered. Outside the house, it was another effect of the damp, ivy grew in unparalleled profusion. Houses that had been of bare stone were smothered in greenery. No garden, however formal its original design, lacked a shrubbery, a wilderness, a maze. What light penetrated to the bedrooms where children were born was naturally of an obfusc green, and what light penetrated to the drawing-rooms where grown men and women lived came through curtains of brown and purple plush. But the change did not stop at outward things the damp struck within. Men felt the chill in their hearts, the damp in their minds. In a desperate effort to snuggle their feelings into some sort of warmth, one subterfuge was tried after another. Love, birth, and death were all swaddled in a variety of fine phrases. The sexes drew further and further apart. No open conversation was tolerated. Evasions and concealments were sedulously practiced on both sides. 
and just as the ivy and the evergreen rioted in the damp earth outside, so did the same fertility show itself within. The life of the average woman was a succession of childbirths. She married at nineteen, and had fifteen or eighteen children by the time she was thirty, for twins abounded. Thus the British Empire came into existence. And thus, for there is no stopping damp, it gets into the ink-pot as it gets into the woodwork. Sentences swelled, adjectives multiplied, lyrics became epics, and little trifles that had been essays a column long were now encyclopedias in ten or twenty volumes. But Eusebius Chubb shall be our witness to the effect this all had upon the mind of a sensitive man who could do nothing to stop it. There is a passage, towards the end of his memoirs, where he describes how, after writing thirty-five folio pages one morning, all about nothing, he screwed the lid on his ink-pot and went for a turn in his garden. Soon he found himself involved in the shrubbery. Innumerable leaves creaked and glistened above his head. He seemed to himself to crush the mould of a million more under his feet. Thick smoke exuded from a damp bonfire at the end of the garden. He reflected that no fire on earth could ever hope to consume that vast vegetable encumbrance. Wherever he looked, vegetation was rampant. Cucumbers came scrolloping across the grass to his feet. Giant cauliflowers towered deck above deck till they rivaled to his disordered imagination, the elm-trees themselves. Hens laid incessantly eggs of no special tint. Then, remembering with a sigh his own fecundity and his poor wife Jane, now in the throes of her fifteenth confinement indoors, how, he asked himself, could he blame the fowls? He looked upwards into the sky. Did not heaven itself— or that great frontispiece of heaven which is the sky, indicate the ascent, indeed the instigation, of the heavenly hierarchy? For there, winter or summer, year in, year out, the clouds turned and tumbled, like whales, he pondered, or elephants, rather, but no, there was no escaping the simile which was pressed upon him from a thousand airy acres. The whole sky itself, as it spread wide above the British Isles, was nothing but a vast feather-bed, and the undistinguished fecundity of the garden, the bedroom, and the hen-roost was copied there. He went indoors, wrote the passage quoted above, laid his head in a gas-oven, and when they found him later he was past revival. While this went on in every part of England, it was all very well for Orlando to mew herself in her house at Blackfriars and pretend that the climate was the same, that one could still say what one liked, and wear knee-breeches or skirts as the fancy took one. Even she at length was forced to acknowledge that times were changed. One afternoon, in the early part of the century, she was driving through St. James's Park in her old panelled coach, when one of those sunbeams, which occasionally, though not often, managed to come to earth, struggled through, marbling the clouds with strange prismatic colours as it passed. Such a sight was sufficiently strange after the clear and uniform skies of the eighteenth century to cause her to pull the window down and look at it. The puce and flamingo clouds made her think, with a pleasurable anguish, which proves that she was insensibly afflicted with the damp already, of dolphins dying in Ionian seas. But what was her surprise when, as it struck the earth, the sunbeam seemed to call forth, or to light up, a pyramid, hecatomb, or trophy, for it had something of a banquet-table air a conglomeration, at any rate, of the most heterogeneous and ill-assorted objects piled higgledy-piggledy in a vast mound where the statue of Queen Victoria now stands. Draped about a vast cross of fretted and floriated gold were widow's weeds and bridal veils, 
Hooked on to other excrescences were crystal palaces, bassinets, military helmets, memorial wreaths, trousers, whiskers, wedding cakes, cannon, Christmas trees, telescopes, extinct monsters, globes, maps, elephants, and mathematical instruments. The whole, supported like a gigantic coat of arms, on the right side by a female figure clothed in flowing white, on the left by a portly gentleman wearing a frock coat and sponge-bag trousers. The incongruity of the objects, the association of the fully clothed and the partly draped, the garishness of the different colors and their plaid-like juxtapositions, afflicted Orlando with the most profound dismay. She had never in all her life seen anything at once so indecent, so hideous, and so monumental. It might, and indeed it must be, the effect of the sun on the waterlogged air. It would vanish with the first breeze that blew, but, for all that, it looked as she drove past, as if it were destined to endure forever. Nothing, she felt, sinking back into the corner of her coach. No wind, rain, sun, or thunder could ever demolish that garish erection. Only the noses would mottle, and the trumpets would rust, but there they would remain, pointing east, west, south, and north, eternally. She looked back as her coach swept up Constitution Hill. Yes, there it was, still beaming placidly in a light which, she pulled her watch out of her fob, was, of course, the light of twelve o'clock midday. None other could be so prosaic, so matter-of-fact, so impervious to any hint of dawn or sunset, so seemingly calculated to last forever. She was determined not to look again. Already she felt the tides of her blood run sluggishly. But what was more peculiar? A blush, vivid and singular, overspread her cheeks as she passed Buckingham Palace, and her eyes seemed forced by a superior power down upon her knees. Suddenly she saw, with a start, that she was wearing black breeches. She never ceased blushing till she had reached her country house, which, considering the time it takes four horses to trot thirty miles, will be taken, we hope, as a signal proof of her chastity. Once there, she followed what had now become the most imperious need of her nature, and wrapped herself as well as she could in a damask quilt which she snatched from her bed. She explained to the widow Bartholomew, who had succeeded good old Grimsditch as housekeeper, that she felt chilly. "'So do we all, my lady,' said the widow, heaving a profound sigh. "'The walls is sweatin', she said, with a curious, lugubrious complacency. And, sure enough, she had only to lay her hand on the oak panels for the fingerprints to be marked there. The ivy had grown so profusely that many windows were now sealed up. The kitchen was so dark that they could scarcely tell a kettle from a colander. A poor black cat had been mistaken for coals and shoveled on the fire. Most of the maids were already wearing three or four red flannel petticoats, though the month was August. "'But is it true, my lady?' the good woman asked, hugging herself while the golden crucifix heaved on her bosom, that the queen, bless her, is wearing a, what do you call it, a— The good woman hesitated and blushed. A crinoline, Orlando helped her out, for the word had reached Blackfriars. Mrs. Bartholomew nodded. The tears were already running down her cheeks, but as she wept she smiled, for it was pleasant to weep. Were they not all of them weak women? Wearing crinolines the better to conceal the fact, the great fact, the only fact, but nevertheless the deplorable fact, which every modest woman did her best to deny until denial was impossible, the fact that she was about to bear a child, to bear fifteen or twenty children indeed, 
so that most of a modest woman's life was spent, after all, in denying what, on one day at least every year, was made obvious. "'The muffins is keepin' ot," said Mrs. Bartholomew, mopping up her tears, "'in the library.' And, wrapped in a damask bed quilt, to a dish of muffins, Orlando now sat down. "'The muffins is keepin' ot in the library,' Orlando minced out the horrid cockney phrase in Mrs. Bartholomew's refined cockney accents as she drank, but not, she detested the mild fluid, her tea. It was in this very room, she remembered, that Queen Elizabeth had stood astride the fireplace with a flagon of beer in her hand, which she suddenly dashed on the table when Lord Burghley tactlessly used the imperative instead of the subjunctive. "'Little man, little man,' Orlando could hear her say, "'is must a word to be addressed to princes?' And down came the flagon on the table. There was the mark of it still. But when Orlando leapt to her feet, as the mere thought of that great queen commanded, the bed quilt tripped her up and she fell back in her armchair with a curse. Tomorrow she would have to buy twenty yards or more of black bombazine, she supposed, to make a skirt. And then, here she blushed, she would have to buy a crinoline, and then, here she blushed, a bassinet, and then another crinoline, and so on. The blushes came and went with the most exquisite iteration of modesty and shame imaginable. One might see the spirit of the age blowing, now hot, now cold, upon her cheeks. And if the spirit of the age blew a little unequally, the crinoline being blushed for before the husband, her ambiguous position must excuse her. Even her sex was still in dispute, and the irregular life she had lived before. At length the color on her cheeks resumed its stability, and it seemed as if the spirit of the age, if such indeed it were, lay dormant for a time. Then Orlando felt in the bosom of her shirt, as if for some locket or relic of lost affection, and drew out no such thing, but a roll of paper, sea-stained, blood-stained, travel-stained the manuscript of her poem, The Oak Tree. She had carried this about with her for so many years now and in such hazardous circumstances that many of the pages were stained, some were torn, while the straits she had been in for writing paper when with the gypsies had forced her to overscore the margins and cross the lines till the manuscript looked like a piece of darning most conscientiously carried out. She turned back to the first page and read the date, 1586, written in her own boyish hand. She had been working at it for close on three hundred years now. It was time to make an end. And so she began turning and dipping and reading and skipping and thinking as she read how very little she had changed all these years. She had been a gloomy boy in love with death as boys are, and then she had been amorous and florid, and then she had been sprightly and satirical, and sometimes she had tried prose, and sometimes she had tried the drama. Yet through all these changes she had remained, she reflected, fundamentally the same. She had the same brooding meditative temper, the same love of animals in nature, the same passion for the country and the seasons. After all, she thought, getting up and going to the window, nothing has changed. The house, the garden, are precisely as they were. Not a chair has been moved, not a trinket sold. There are the same walks, the same lawns, the same trees, and the same pool, with, I dare say, the same carp in it. True, Queen Victoria is on the throne and not Queen Elizabeth, but what difference? No sooner had the thought taken shape 
Then, as if to rebuke it, the door was flung wide, and in marched Basket, the butler, followed by Bartholomew, the housekeeper, to clear away tea. Orlando, who had just dipped her pen in the ink and was about to indict some reflection upon the eternity of all things, was much annoyed to be impeded by a blot, which spread and meandered round her pen. It was some infirmity of the quill, she supposed. It was split or dirty. She dipped it again. The blot increased. She tried to go on with what she was saying. No words came. Next she tried to decorate the blot with wings and whiskers, till it became a round-headed monster, something between a bat and a wombat. But as for writing poetry with Basket and Bartholomew in the room, it was impossible. No sooner had she said, Impossible, than, to her astonishment and alarm, the pen began to curve and caracol with the smoothest possible fluency. Her page was written in the neatest sloping Italian hand, with the most insipid verse she had ever read in her life. I am myself but a vile link amid life's weary chain. But I have spoken hallowed words, oh, do not say, in vain. Will the young maiden, when her tears alone in moonlight shine, Tears for the absent and the loved, murmur, she wrote, without a stop, as Bartholomew and Basket grunted and groaned about the room, mending the fire, picking up the muffins. Again she dipped her pen, and off it went. She was so changed, the soft carnation cloud, once mantling o'er her cheek, like that which Eve hangs o'er the sky, glowing with roseate hue, had faded into paleness broken by bright burning blushes, torches of the tomb. But here, by an abrupt movement, she spilt the ink over the page and blotted it from human sight, she hoped, for ever. She was all of a quiver, all of a stew. Nothing more repulsive could be imagined than to feel the ink flowing thus in cascades of involuntary inspiration. What had happened to her? Was it the damp? Was it Bartholomew? Was it Basket? What was it? she demanded. But the room was empty. No one answered her, unless the dripping of the rain in the ivy could be taken for an answer. Meanwhile, she became conscious, as she stood at the window, of an extraordinary tingling and vibration all over her, as if she were made of a thousand wires upon which some breeze or errant fingers were playing scales. Now her toes tingled, now her marrow. She had the queerest sensations about the thigh bones. Her hairs seemed to erect themselves. Her arms sang and twanged, as the telegraph wires would be singing and twanging in twenty years or so. But all this agitation seemed at length to concentrate in her hands, and then in one hand, and then in one finger of that hand, and then, finally, to contract itself so that it made a ring of quivering sensibility about the second finger of the left hand. And when she raised it to see what caused this agitation, she saw nothing, nothing but the vast solitary emerald which Queen Elizabeth had given her. And was that not enough? she asked. It was of the finest water. It was worth ten thousand pounds at least. The vibration seemed in the oddest way, but remember, we are dealing with some of the darkest manifestations of the human soul, to say, no, that is not enough, and further to assume a note of interrogation, as though they were asking, what did it mean, this hiatus, this strange oversight? Till poor Orlando felt positively ashamed of the second finger of her left hand, without in the least knowing why. At this moment Bartholomew came in to ask which dress she should lay out for dinner, 
and Orlando, whose senses were much quickened, instantly glanced at Bartholomew's left hand, and instantly perceived which she had never noticed before. A thick ring of rather jaundiced yellow, circling the second finger where her own was bare. "'Let me look at your ring, Bartholomew,' she said, stretching her hand to take it. At this Bartholomew made as if she had been struck in the breast by a rogue. She started back a pace or two, clenched her hand, and flung it away from her with a gesture that was noble in the extreme. "'No,' she said, with resolute dignity. Her ladyship might look if she pleased, but as for taking off her wedding ring, not the archbishop, nor the pope, nor Queen Victoria on her throne could force her to do that. Her Thomas had put it on her finger twenty-five years, six months, three weeks ago. She had slept in it, worked in it, washed in it, prayed in it, and proposed to be buried in it. In fact, Orlando understood her to say, but her voice was much broken with emotion, that it was by the gleam on her wedding ring that she would be assigned her station among the angels, and its luster would be tarnished for ever if she let it out of her keeping for a second. "'Heaven help us,' said Orlando, standing at the window and watching the pigeons at their pranks. "'What a world we live in! What a world, to be sure!' Its complexities amazed her. It now seemed to her that the whole world was ringed with gold." She went in to dinner. Wedding rings abounded. She went to church. Wedding rings were everywhere. She drove out. Gold or pinchbeck, thin, thick, plain, smooth, they glowed dully on every hand. Rings filled the jeweler's shops, not the flashing paste and diamonds of Orlando's recollection, but simple bands without a stone in them. At the same time, she began to notice a new habit among the town people. In the old days, one would meet a boy trifling with a girl under a hawthorn hedge frequently enough. Orlando had flicked many a couple with the tip of her whip and laughed and passed on. Now all that was changed. Couples trudged and plodded in the middle of the road, indissolubly linked together. The woman's right hand, was invariably passed through the man's left, and her fingers were firmly gripped by his. Often it was not till the horses' noses were on them that they budged, and then, though they moved, it was all in one piece, heavily, to the side of the road. Orlando could only suppose that some new discovery had been made about the race. They were somehow stuck together, couple after couple, but who had made it and when, she could not guess. It did not seem to be nature. She looked at the doves and the rabbits and the elk hounds, and she could not see that nature had changed her ways or mended them since the time of Elizabeth, at least. There was no indissoluble alliance among the brutes that she could see. Could it be Queen Victoria, then? Or Lord Melbourne? Was it from them that the great discovery of marriage proceeded? Yet the queen, she pondered, was said to be fond of dogs, and Lord Melbourne, she had heard, was said to be fond of women. It was strange. It was distasteful. Indeed, there was something in this indissolubility of bodies which was repugnant to her sense of decency and sanitation. Her ruminations, however, were accompanied by such a tingling and twangling of the afflicted finger that she could scarcely keep her ideas in order. They were languishing and ogling like a housemaid's fancies. They made her blush. There was nothing for it but to buy one of those ugly bands and wear it like the rest. This she did, slipping it, overcome with shame, upon her finger in the shadow of a curtain, but without avail. The tingling persisted more violently, more indignantly than ever. She did not sleep a wink that night. Next morning, when she took up the pen to write, either she could think of nothing, 
and the pen made one large lacrimose blot after another, or it ambled off more alarmingly still into mellifluous fluencies about early death and corruption, which were worse than no thinking at all. For it would seem, her case proved it, that we write not with the fingers but with the whole person. The nerve which controls the pen winds itself about every fibre of our being, threads the heart, pierces the liver. Though the seat of her trouble seemed to be the left finger, she could feel herself poisoned through and through, and was forced at length to consider the most desperate of remedies, which was to yield completely and submissively to the spirit of the age, and take a husband. That this was much against her natural temperament has been sufficiently made plain. When the sound of the archduke's chariot wheels died away, the cry that rose to her lips was, Life, a lover, not life, a husband. And it was in pursuit of this aim that she had gone to town and run about the world, as has been shown in the previous chapter. Such is the indomitable nature of the spirit of the age, however, that it batters down anyone who tries to make stand against it far more effectually than those who bend its own way. Orlando had inclined herself naturally to the Elizabethan spirit, to the Restoration spirit, to the spirit of the eighteenth century, and had in consequence scarcely been aware of the change from one age to the other. But the spirit of the nineteenth century was antipathetic to her in the extreme, and thus it took her and broke her, and she was aware of her defeat at its hands as she had never been before. For it is probable that the human spirit has its place in time assigned to it. Some are born of this age, some of that. And now that Orlando was grown a woman, a year or two past thirty indeed, the lines of her character were fixed, and to bend them the wrong way was intolerable. So she stood mournfully at the drawing-room window, Bartholomew had so christened the library, dragged down by the weight of the crinoline which she had submissively adopted. It was heavier and more drab than any dress she had yet worn. None had ever so impeded her movements. No longer could she stride through the garden with her dogs, or run lightly to the high mound and fling herself beneath the oak tree. Her skirts collected damp leaves and straw. The plumed hat tossed on the breeze. The thin shoes were quickly soaked and mud-caked. Her muscles had lost their pliancy. She had become nervous, lest there should be robbers behind the wainscot, and afraid, for the first time in her life, of ghosts in the corridors. All these things inclined her, step by step, to submit to the new discovery, whether Queen Victoria's or another's, that each man and each woman has another allotted to it for life, whom it supports by whom it is supported till death them do part. It would be a comfort, she felt, to lean, to sit down, yes, to lie down, never, never, never to get up again. Thus did the spirit work upon her for all her past pride, and as she came sloping down the scale of emotion to this lowly and unaccustomed lodging place, those twanglings and tinglings which had been so captious and so interrogative modulated into the sweetest melodies, till it seemed as if angels were plucking harp-strings with white fingers, and her whole being was pervaded by a seraphic harmony. But whom could she lean upon? She asked that question of the wild autumn winds, for it was now October and wet as usual. Not the archduke, he had married a very great lady, and had hunted hares in Romania these many years now. Nor Mr. M, he was become a Catholic. Nor the Marquis of C, he made sacks in Botany Bay. Nor the Lord O, 
he had long been food for fishes. One way or another all her old cronies were gone now, and the Nells and the Kits of Drury Lane, much though she favoured them, scarcely did to lean upon. Whom, she asked, casting her eyes upon the revolving clouds, clasping her hands as she knelt on the window sill, and looking the very image of appealing womanhood as she did so. Can I lean upon? Her words formed themselves, her hands clasped themselves involuntarily, just as her pen had written of its own accord. It was not Orlando who spoke, but the spirit of the age. But whichever it was, nobody answered it. The rooks were tumbling pell-mell among the violet clouds of autumn. The rain had stopped at last, and there was an iridescence in the sky which tempted her to put on her plumed hat and her little string shoes and stroll out before dinner. "'Everyone is mated except myself,' she mused, as she trailed disconsolately across the courtyard. There were the rooks. Canute and Pippin, even, transitory as their alliances were, still each this evening seemed to have a partner. Whereas I, who am mistress of it all, Orlando thought, glancing as she passed at the innumerable emblazoned windows of the hall, am single, am mateless, am alone. Such thoughts had never entered her head before. Now they bore her down unescapably. Instead of thrusting the gate open, she tapped with a gloved hand for the porter to unfasten it for her. One must lean on someone, she thought, if it is only on a porter, and half wished to stay behind and help him to grill his chop on a bucket of fiery coals, but was too timid to ask it. So she strayed out into the park alone, faltering at first, and apprehensive lest there might be poachers or gamekeepers or even errand boys to marvel that a great lady should walk alone. At every step she glanced nervously, lest some male form should be hiding behind a furze bush or some savage cow be lowering its horns to toss her but there were only the rooks flaunting in the sky. A steel-blue plume from one of them fell among the heather. She loved wild birds' feathers. She had used to collect them as a boy. She picked it up and stuck it in her hat. The air blew upon her spirit somewhat and revived it. As the rooks went whirling and wheeling above her head, and feather after feather fell gleaming through the purplish air, she followed them, her long cloak floating behind her, over the moor, up the hill. She had not walked so far for years. Six feathers had she picked from the grass and drawn between her fingertips and pressed to her lips to feel their smooth, glinting plumage, when she saw, gleaming on the hillside, a silver pool, mysterious as the lake into which Sir Bedivere flung the sword of Arthur. A single feather quivered in the air and fell into the middle of it. Then some strange ecstasy came over her, some wild notion she had of following the birds to the rim of the world and flinging herself on the spongy turf and there drinking forgetfulness, while the rook's hoarse laughter sounded over her. She quickened her pace, she ran, she tripped. The tough heather roots flung her to the ground. Her ankle was broken. She could not rise. But there she lay, content. The scent of the bog myrtle and the meadow sweet was in her nostrils. The rook's hoarse laughter was in her ears. I have found my mate, she murmured. It is the moor. I am nature's bride, she whispered, giving herself in rapture to the cold embraces of the grass, as she lay folded in her cloak in the hollow by the pool. Here will I lie. A feather fell upon her brow. I have found a greener laurel than the bay. My forehead will be cool always. These are wild birds' feathers, the owls, the nightjars. I shall dream wild dreams. 
My hands shall wear no wedding ring, she continued, slipping it from her finger. The roots shall twine about them. Ah, she sighed, pressing her head luxuriously on its spongy pillow. I have sought happiness through many ages and not found it. Fame and missed it. Love and not known it. Life, and behold, death is better. I have known many men and many women, she continued. None have I understood. It is better that I should lie at peace here with only the sky above me. As the gypsy told me years ago, that was in Turkey. And she looked straight up into the marvelous golden foam into which the clouds had churned themselves, and saw next moment a track in it, and camels passing in single file through the rocky desert among clouds of red dust. And then, when the camels had passed, there were only mountains, very high and full of clefts and with pinnacles of rock. And she fancied she heard goat bells ringing in their passes, and in their folds were fields of irises and gentians. So the sky changed, and her eyes slowly lowered themselves down and down, till they came to the rain-darkened earth, and saw the great hump of the South Downs flowing in one wave along the coast. And where the land parted there was the sea, the sea with ships passing. And she fancied she heard a gun far out at sea, and thought at first, that's the Armada. And then she thought, no, it's Nelson. And then remembered how those wars were over and the ships were busy merchant ships, and the sails on the winding river were those of pleasure boats. She saw, too, cattle sprinkled on the dark fields, sheep and cows, and she saw the lights coming here and there in farmhouse windows, and lanterns moving among the cattle as the shepherd went his rounds and the cowman. And then the lights went out, and the stars rose and tangled themselves about the sky. Indeed, she was falling asleep with the wet feathers on her face and her ear pressed to the ground when she heard, deep within, some hammer on an anvil. Or was it a heart beating? Tick-tock, tick-tock, so it hammered, so it beat the anvil, or the heart in the middle of the earth, until, as she listened, she thought it changed to the trot of a horse's hoofs. One, two, three, four, she counted. Then she heard a stumble. Then, as it came nearer and nearer, she could hear the crack of a twig and the suck of the wet bog in its hoofs. The horse was almost on her. She sat upright, towering dark against the yellow-slash sky of dawn, with the plovers rising and falling about him. She saw a man on horseback. He started. The horse stopped. Madam, the man cried, leaping to the ground, you're hurt. I'm dead, sir, she replied. A few minutes later, they became engaged. The morning after, as they sat at breakfast, he told her his name. It was Marmaduke Bonthrop Shelmerdine, Esquire. I knew it, she said for there was something romantic and chivalrous, passionate, melancholy, yet determined about him, which went with the wild, dark-plumed name, a name which had in her mind the steel-blue gleam of rooks' wings, the hoarse laughter of their caws, the snake-like twisting descent of their feathers in a silver pool, and a thousand other things besides, which will be described presently. Mine is Orlando she said. He had guessed it. For if you see a ship in full sail coming with the sun on it, proudly sweeping across the Mediterranean from the South Seas, one says at once, Orlando, he explained. In fact, though their acquaintance had been so short, they had guessed, as always happens between lovers, everything of any importance about each other in two seconds at the utmost and it now remained only to fill in such unimportant details as what they were called, where they lived, and whether they were beggars or people of substance. He had a castle in the Hebrides, but it was ruined, he told her, 
gannets feasted in the banqueting hall. He had been a soldier and a sailor, and had explored the east. He was on his way now to join his brig at Falmouth, but the wind had fallen, and it was only when the gale blew from the southwest that he could put out to sea. Orlando looked hastily out of the breakfast-room window at the gilt leopard on the weather vane. Mercifully, his tail pointed due east and was steady as a rock. "'Oh, Shell, don't leave me!' she cried. "'I'm passionately in love with you,' she said. No sooner had the words left her mouth than an awful suspicion rushed into both their minds simultaneously. "'You're a woman, Shell,' she cried. "'You're a man, Orlando,' he cried. Never was there such a scene of protestation and demonstration as then took place since the world began. When it was over, and they were seated again, she asked him, What was this talk of a southwest gale? Where was he bound for? For the horn, he said briefly, and blushed. For a man had to blush as a woman had, only at rather different things. It was only by dint of great pressure on her side and the use of much intuition that she gathered that his life was spent in the most desperate and splendid of adventures, which is to voyage round Cape Horn in the teeth of a gale. Masts had been snapped off, sails torn to ribbons. She had to drag the admission from him. Sometimes the ship had sunk, and he had been left the only survivor on a raft with a biscuit. "'It's about all a fellow can do nowadays,' he said sheepishly, and helped himself to great spoonfuls of strawberry jam. The vision which she had thereupon of this boy, for he was little more, sucking peppermints, for which he had a passion, while the mast snapped and the stars reeled, and he roared brief orders to cut this adrift, to stow that overboard, brought the tears to her eyes— Tears, she noted, of a finer flavor than any she had cried before. I am a woman, she thought, a real woman at last. She thanked Bonthrop from the bottom of her heart for having given her this rare and unexpected delight. Had she not been lame in the left foot, she would have sat upon his knee. Shell, my darling, she began again, tell me— and so they talked two hours or more. Perhaps about Cape Horn, perhaps not, and really it would profit little to write down what they said, for they knew each other so well that they could say anything they liked, which is tantamount to saying nothing, or saying such stupid, prosy things as how to cook an omelette, or where to buy the best boots in London, which have no luster taken from their setting, yet are positively of amazing beauty within it for it has come about by the wise economy of nature, that our modern spirit can almost dispense with language. The commonest expressions do, since no expressions do. Hence the most ordinary conversation is often the most poetic, and the most poetic is precisely that which cannot be written down. For which reasons we leave a great blank here, which must be taken to indicate that the space is filled to repletion. After some days more of this kind of talk, Orlando, my dearest, Shell was beginning, when there was a scuffling outside, and Basket the butler entered with the information that there was a couple of peelers downstairs with a warrant from the Queen. "'Show em up,' said Shelmerdine briefly. As if on his own quarter-deck, taking up, by instinct, a stand with his hands behind him in front of the fireplace. Two officers, in bottle-green uniforms, with truncheons at their hips, then entered the room and stood at attention. Formalities being over, they gave into Orlando's own hands, as their commission was, a legal document of some very impressive sort, judging by the blobs of sealing-wax, the ribbons, the oaths, and the signatures, which were all of the highest importance. Orlando ran her eyes through it and then, using the first finger of her right hand as pointer, 
read out the following facts as being most germane to the matter. The lawsuits are settled, she read out, some in my favor, as, for example, others not. Turkish marriage annulled, I was ambassador in Constantinople, Shell, she explained. Children pronounced illegitimate. They said I had three sons by Pepita, a Spanish dancer. So they don't inherit, which is all to the good. Sex? Ah, what about sex? My sex, she read out with some solemnity, is pronounced indisputably, and beyond the shadow of a doubt, what was I telling you a moment ago, Shell? Female. The estates which are now desequestrated in perpetuity descend and are tailed and entailed upon the heirs male of my body, or in default of marriage. But here she grew impatient with this legal verbiage, and said, But there won't be any default of marriage, nor of heirs either, so the rest can be taken as read. Whereupon she appended her own signature, beneath Lord Palmerston's, and entered from that moment into the undisturbed possession of her titles, her house, and her estate, which were now so much shrunk, for the cost of the lawsuits had been prodigious, that though she was infinitely noble again, she was also excessively poor. When the result of the lawsuit was made known, and rumor flew much quicker than the telegraph which has supplanted it, the whole town was filled with rejoicings. Horses were put into carriages for the sole purpose of being taken out. Empty barouches and landaus were trundled up and down the high street incessantly. Addresses were read from the bull. Replies were made from the stag. The town was illuminated. Gold caskets were securely sealed in glass cases. Coins were well and duly laid under stones. Hospitals were founded. Rat and sparrow clubs were inaugurated. Turkish women by the dozen were burnt in effigy in the marketplace, together with scores of peasant boys with the label, I am a base pretender, lolling from their mouths. The queen's cream-colored ponies were soon seen trotting up the avenue with a command to Orlando to dine and sleep at the castle that very same night. Her table, as on a previous occasion, was snowed under with invitations from the Countess of R., Lady Q., Lady Palmerston, the Marchioness of P., Mrs. W. E. Gladstone, and others, beseeching the pleasure of her company, reminding her of ancient alliances between their family and her own, etc., all of which is properly enclosed in square brackets, as above, for the good reason that a parenthesis it was, without any importance in Orlando's life. She skipped it, to get on with the text for when the bonfires were blazing in the marketplace, she was in the dark woods with Shelmerdine alone. So fine was the weather that the trees stretched their branches motionless above them, and if a leaf fell, it fell, spotted red and gold, so slowly that one could watch it for half an hour fluttering and falling till it came to rest at last on Orlando's foot. Tell me, Mar she would say, and here it must be explained, that when she called him by the first syllable of his first name, she was in a dreamy, amorous, acquiescent mood, domestic, languid a little, as if spiced logs were burning, and it was evening, not yet time to dress, and a thought wet, perhaps, outside, enough to make the leaves glisten, but a nightingale might be singing even so among the azaleas, two or three dogs barking at distant farms, a cock crowing, all of which the reader should imagine in her voice. "'Tell me, Mar,' she would say, "'about Cape Horn.' Then Shelmerdine would make a little model on the ground of the cape with twigs and dead leaves and an empty snail-shell or two. "'Here's the north,' he would say. "'There's the south.' the winds coming from hereabouts. Now the brig is sailing due west. We've just lowered the top boom mizzen, and so you see, here, where this bit of grass is, she enters the current, which you'll find marked, where's my map and compasses, bosun? Ah, thanks, that'll do, where the snail shell is. 
The current catches her on the starboard side, so we must rig the jib-boom or we shall be carried to the larboard, which is where that beech-leaf is, for you must understand, my dear. And so he would go on, and she would listen to every word, interpreting them rightly, so as to see, that is to say, without his having to tell her, the phosphorescence on the waves, the icicles clanking in the shrouds, how he went to the top of the mast in a gale, there reflected on the destiny of man, came down again, had a whiskey and soda, went on shore, was trapped by a black woman, repented, reasoned it out, read Pascal, determined to write philosophy, bought a monkey, debated the true end of life, decided in favor of Cape Horn, and so on. All this and a thousand other things she understood him to say, and so, when she replied, yes, negresses are seductive, aren't they? He having told her that the supply of biscuits now gave out, he was surprised and delighted to find how well she had taken his meaning. Are you positive you aren't a man? he would ask anxiously, and she would echo, can it be possible you're not a woman? And then they must put it to the proof, without more ado. For each was so surprised at the quickness of the other's sympathy. And it was to each such a revelation that a woman could be as tolerant and free-spoken as a man, and a man as strange and subtle as a woman, that they had to put the matter to the proof at once. And so they would go on talking, or rather, Understanding, which has become the main art of speech, in an age when words are growing daily so scanty, in comparison with ideas that the biscuits ran out, has to stand for kissing a negress in the dark when one has just read Bishop Barclay's philosophy for the tenth time. And from this it follows that only the most profound masters of style can tell the truth. And when one meets a simple, one-syllabled writer— one may conclude without any doubt at all that the poor man is lying. So they would talk, and then, when her feet were fairly covered with spotted autumn leaves, Orlando would rise and stroll away into the heart of the woods in solitude, leaving Bonthrop sitting there among the snail shells, making models of Cape Horn. Bonthrop, she would say, I'm off. And when she called him by his second name, Bonthrop, it should signify to the reader that she was in a solitary mood, felt them both as specks on a desert, was desirous only of meeting death by herself, for people die daily, die at dinner-tables, or like this, out of doors in the autumn woods, and with the bonfires blazing, and Lady Palmerston or Lady Derby asking her out every night to dinner. The desire for death would overcome her, and so saying, Bonthrop, she said in effect, I'm dead, and pushed her way as a spirit might through the spectre-pale beech trees, and so oared herself deep into solitude, as if the little flicker of noise and movement were over, and she were free now to take her way, all of which the reader should hear in her voice when she said, Bonthrop, and should also add, the better to illumine the word, that for him, too, the word signified, mystically, separation and isolation and the disembodied pacing the deck of his brig in unfathomable seas. After some hours of death, suddenly a jay shrieked, Shelmerdine! And stooping, she picked one of those autumn crocuses, which to some people signify that very word, and put it with the jay's feather that came tumbling blue through the beech woods in her breast. Then she called, Shelmerdine, and the word went shooting this way and that through the woods and struck him where he sat, making models out of snail shells in the grass. He saw her and heard her coming to him with the crocus and the jay's feather in her breast and cried, Orlando, which meant, and it must be remembered, that when bright colors like blue and yellow mix themselves in our thoughts, some of it rubs off on our words. First, the bowing and swaying of bracken, as if something were breaking through. 
which proved to be a ship in full sail, heaving and tossing a little dreamily, rather as if she had a whole year of summer days to make her voyage in. And so the ship bears down, heaving this way, heaving that way, nobly, indolently, and rides over the crest of this wave and sinks into the hollow of that one, and so suddenly stands over you, who are in a little cockle-shell of a boat looking up at her, with all her sails quivering, and then, behold, they drop all of a heap on deck, as Orlando dropped now into the grass beside him. Eight or nine days had been spent thus, but on the tenth, which was the twenty-sixth of October, Orlando was lying in the bracken, while Shelmerdine recited Shelley, whose entire works he had by heart, when a leaf, which had started to fall slowly enough from a treetop, whipped briskly across Orlando's foot. A second leaf followed, and then a third. Orlando shivered and turned pale. It was the wind. Shelmerdine, but it would be more proper now to call him Bonthrop, leaped to his feet. The wind, he cried. Together they ran through the woods, the wind plastering them with leaves as they ran, to the great court, and through it, and the little courts, frightened servants leaving their brooms, their saucepans, to follow after, till they reached the chapel. And there a scattering of lights was lit as fast as could be, one knocking over this bench, another snuffing out that taper. Bells were rung, people were summoned. At length there was Mr. Dupper, catching at the ends of his white tie, and asking where was the prayer book and they thrust Queen Mary's prayer-book in his hands, and he searched hastily, fluttering the pages, and said, Marmaduke Bonthrop Shelmerdine, and Lady Orlando, kneel down. And they knelt down, and now they were bright, and now they were dark, as the light and shadow came flying helter-skelter through the painted windows, and among the banging of innumerable doors and a sound like brass pots beating, the organ sounded its growl coming loud and faint alternately, and Mr. Dupper, who was grown a very old man, tried now to raise his voice above the uproar, and could not be heard, and then all was quiet for a moment, and one word, it might be, the jaws of death, rang out clear, while all the estate servants kept pressing in with rakes and whips still in their hands to listen and some sang aloud, and others prayed, and now a bird was dashed against the pane, and now there was a clap of thunder, so that no one heard the word, Obey, spoken, or saw, except as a golden flash, the ring pass from hand to hand. All was movement and confusion. And up they rose with the organ booming, and the lightning playing, and the rain pouring, and the Lady Orlando, with her ring on her finger, went out into the court in her thin dress, and held the swinging stirrup, for the horse was bitted and bridled, and the foam was still on his flank, for her husband to mount, which he did with one bound, and the horse leapt forward, and Orlando, standing there, cried out, Marmaduke Bonthrop Shelmerdine! And he answered her, Orlando, and the words went dashing and circling like wild hawks together among the belfries, and higher and higher, further and further, faster and faster they circled, till they crashed and fell in a shower of fragments to the ground, and she went in. End of section nine. Section ten. Of Orlando, a Biography by Virginia Woolf. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 6, Part 1. Orlando went indoors. It was completely still. It was very silent. There was the ink pot. There was the pen. There was the manuscript of her poem broken off in the middle of a tribute to eternity. She had been about to say, when Basket and Bartholomew interrupted with the tea-things, nothing changes. And then, in the space of three seconds and a half, everything had changed. She had broken her ankle, fallen in love, married Shelmerdine. 
There was the wedding ring on her finger to prove it. It was true that she had put it there herself before she met Shelmerdine, but that had proved worse than useless. She now turned the ring round and round with superstitious reverence, taking care that it should not slip past the finger joint. The wedding ring has to be put on the second finger of the left hand, she said, like a child cautiously repeating its lesson, for it to be of any use at all. She spoke thus, aloud and rather more pompously than was her wont, as if she wished someone whose good opinion she desired to overhear her. Indeed, she had in mind, now that she was at last able to collect her thoughts, the effect that her behavior would have had upon the spirit of the age. She was extremely anxious to be informed whether the steps she had taken in the matter of getting engaged to Shelmerdine and marrying him met with its approval. She was certainly feeling more herself. Her finger had not tingled once, or nothing to count, since that night on the moor. Yet she could not deny that she had her doubts. She was married, true. But if one's husband was always sailing round Cape Horn, was it marriage? If one liked him, was it marriage? If one liked other people, was it marriage? And finally, if one still wished, more than anything in the whole world, to write poetry, was it marriage? She had her doubts. But she would put it to the test. She looked at the ring. She looked at the inkpot. Did she dare? No, she did not. But she must. No, she could not. What should she do then? Faint, if possible. But she had never felt better in her life. Hang it all, she cried, with a touch of her old spirit. Here goes. And she plunged her pen neck deep in the ink. To her enormous surprise, there was no explosion. She drew the nib out. It was wet, but not dripping. She wrote. The words were a little long in coming, but come they did. Ah, but did they make sense, she wondered, a panic coming over her, lest it might have been at some of its involuntary pranks again. She read. And then I came to a field where the springing grass was dulled by the hanging cups of fritillaries, sullen and foreign-looking, the snaky flower, scarfed in dull purple like Egyptian girls. At this point she felt that power—remember, we are dealing with the most obscure manifestations of the human spirit—which had been reading over her shoulder, tell her to stop. Grass, the power seemed to say, going back with a ruler such as governesses use to the beginning, is all right. The hanging cups of fritillaries? Admirable. The snaky flower? A thought strong from a lady's pen, perhaps, but Wordsworth, no doubt, sanctions it. But girls? Are girls necessary? You have a husband at the Cape, you say? Ah, well, that'll do. And so the spirit passed on. Orlando now performed, in spirit, for all this took place in spirit, a deep obeisance to the spirit of her age, such as, to compare great things with small, a traveller, conscious that he has a bundle of cigars in the corner of his suitcase, makes to the customs officer who has obligingly made a scribble of white chalk on the lid for she was extremely doubtful whether, if the spirit had examined the contents of her mind carefully, it would not have found something highly contraband for which she would have had to pay the full fine. She had only escaped by the skin of her teeth. She had just managed, by some dexterous deference to the spirit of the age, by putting on a ring and finding a man on a moor, by loving nature and being no satirist, cynic, or psychologist, any one of which goods would have been discovered at once, to pass its examination successfully. And she heaved a deep sigh of relief, as indeed well she might, 
for the transaction between a writer and the spirit of the age is one of infinite delicacy, and upon a nice arrangement between the two, the whole fortune of his works depends. Orlando had so ordered it that she was in an extremely happy position. She need neither fight her age nor submit to it. She was of it, yet remained herself. Now, therefore, she could write. And write she did. She wrote. She wrote. She wrote. It was now November. After November comes December. Then January, February, March, and April. After April comes May. June, July, August follow. Next is September. Then October, and so, behold, here we are back at November again with a whole year accomplished. This method of writing biography, though it has its merits, is a little bare, perhaps. And the reader, if we go on with it, may complain that he could recite the calendar for himself, and so save his pocket whatever sum the publisher may think proper to charge for this book. But what can the biographer do when his subject has put him in the predicament in which Orlando has now put us? Life, it has been agreed by everyone whose opinion is worth consulting, is the only fit subject for novelist or biographer. Life, the same authorities have decided, has nothing whatever to do with sitting still in a chair and thinking. Thought and life are as the poles asunder. Therefore, since sitting in a chair and thinking is precisely what Orlando is doing now, there is nothing for it but to recite the calendar, tell one's beads, blow one's nose, stir the fire, look out of the window, until she has done. Orlando sat so still that you could have heard a pin drop. Would indeed that a pin had dropped. That would have been life, of a kind. Or if a butterfly had fluttered through the window and settled on her chair, one could write about that. Or suppose she had got up and killed a wasp. Then at once we could out with our pens and write, for there would be blood shed, if only the blood of a wasp. And if killing a wasp is the merest trifle compared with killing a man, still it is a fitter subject for novelist or biographer than this mere wool-gathering, this thinking, this sitting in a chair day in, day out, with a cigarette and a sheet of paper and a pen and an ink-pot. If only subjects, we might complain, for our patience is wearing thin, had more consideration for their biographers. What is more irritating than to see one subject on whom one has lavished so much time and trouble, slipping out of one's grasp altogether and indulging, witness her sighs and gasps, her flushing, her palings, her eyes now bright as lamps, now haggard as dawns. What is more humiliating than to see all this dumb show of emotion and excitement gone through before our eyes? when we know that what causes it, thought and imagination, are of no importance whatsoever. But Orlando was a woman. Lord Palmerston had just proved it. And when we are writing the life of a woman, we may, it is agreed, waive our demand for action and substitute love instead. Love, the poet has said, is woman's whole existence. And if we look for a moment at Orlando writing at her table, we must admit that never was there a woman more fitted for that calling. Surely, since she is a woman, and a beautiful woman, and a woman in the prime of life, she will soon give over this pretense of writing and thinking, and begin to think, at least, of a gamekeeper. And as long as she thinks of a man, nobody objects to a woman thinking. And then she will write him a little note. As long as she writes little notes, Nobody objects to a woman writing, either. And make an assignation for Sunday dusk. And Sunday dusk will come, and the gamekeeper will whistle under the window, all of which is, of course, the very stuff of life, and the only possible subject for fiction. Surely Orlando must have done one of these things. Alas, 
a thousand times, alas, Orlando did none of them. Must it then be admitted that Orlando was one of those monsters of iniquity who do not love? She was kind to dogs, faithful to friends, generosity itself to a dozen starving poets, had a passion for poetry. But love, as the male novelists define it, and who, after all, speak with greater authority, has nothing whatever to do with kindness, fidelity, generosity, or poetry. Love is slipping off one's petticoat and— But we all know what love is. Did Orlando do that? Truth compels us to say no, she did not. If, then, the subject of one's biography will neither love nor kill, but will only think and imagine, we may conclude that he or she is no better than a corpse, and so leave her. The only resource now left us is to look out of the window. There were sparrows, there were starlings, there were a number of doves, and one or two rooks, all occupied after their fashion. One finds a worm, another a snail. One flutters to a branch, another takes a little run on the turf. Then a servant crosses the courtyard wearing a green baize apron. Presumably he is engaged on some intrigue with one of the maids in the pantry, but as no visible proof is offered us in the courtyard, we can but hope for the best and leave it. Clouds pass, thin or thick, with some disturbance of the color of the grass beneath. The sundial registers the hour in its usual cryptic way. One's mind begins tossing up a question or two, idly, vainly, about this same life. Life, it sings, or croons, rather, like a kettle on a hob. Life, life, what art thou? Light or darkness? The bay's apron of the underfootman, or the shadow of the starling on the grass? Let us go, then, exploring this summer morning, when all are adoring the plum blossom and the bee. And humming and hawing, let us ask of the starling, who is a more sociable bird than the lark, would he, may think, on the brink of the dustbin, whence he picks among the sticks combings of scullion's hair? What's life, we ask, leaning on the farmyard gate? Life, 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 cries the bird, as if he had heard, and knew precisely, what we meant by this bothering, prying habit of ours, of asking questions indoors and out, and peeping and picking at daisies, as the way is of writers when they don't know what to say next. Then they come here, says the bird, and ask me what life is. Life, life, life. We trudge on, then, by the moor path, to the high brow of the wine-blue purple-dark hill, and fling ourselves down there, and dream there, and see there a grasshopper carting back to his home in the hollow a straw. And he says, if sawings like his can be given a name so sacred and tender, life's labor, or so we interpret the whir of his dust-choked gullet. And the ant agrees, and the bees. But if we lie here long enough to ask the moths, when they come at evening, stealing among the paler heather bells, they will breathe in our ears such wild nonsense as one hears from telegraph wires in snowstorms. Tee-hee, ha-ha, laughter, laughter, the moths say. Having asked then of man and of bird and the insects, for fish, men tell us, who have lived in green caves, solitary for years, to hear them speak, never, never say, and so perhaps know what life is. Having asked them all, and grown no wiser, but only older and colder, for did we not pray once in a way to wrap up in a book something so hard, so rare, one could swear it was life's meaning? Back we must go and say straight out to the reader, who waits a tiptoe to hear what life is. Alas, we don't know. At this moment, but only just in time to save the book from extinction, Orlando pushed away her chair, stretched her arms, dropped her pen, came to the window, and exclaimed, Done! She was almost felled to the ground by the extraordinary sight which now met her eyes. 
there was the garden and some birds the world was going on as usual all the time she was writing the world had continued and if i were dead it would be just the same she exclaimed such was the intensity of her feelings that she could even imagine that she had suffered dissolution and perhaps some faintness actually attacked her for a moment she stood looking at the fair indifferent spectacle with staring eyes at length she was revived in a singular way the manuscript which reposed above her heart began shuffling and beating as if it were a living thing and what was still odder and showed how fine a sympathy was between them orlando by inclining her head could make out what it was that it was saying it wanted to be read it must be read it would die in her bosom if it were not read for the first time in her life she turned with violence against nature elk hounds and rose bushes were about her in profusion but elk hounds and rose bushes can none of them read it is a lamentable oversight on the part of providence which had never struck her before human beings alone have this power human beings had become necessary she rang the bell she ordered the carriage to take her to london at once there's just time to catch the eleven forty five my lady said basket orlando had not yet realized the invention of the steam engine but such was her absorption in the sufferings of a being who though not herself yet entirely depended on her that she saw a railway train for the first time took her seat in a railway carriage and had the rug arranged about her knees without giving a thought to that stupendous invention which had the historians say completely changed the face of europe in the past twenty years as indeed happens much more frequently than historians suppose she noticed only that it was extremely smutty rattled horribly and the windows stuck lost in thought she was whirled up to london in something less than an hour and stood on the platform at charing cross not knowing where to go the old house at blackfriars where she had spent so many pleasant days in the eighteenth century was now sold part to the salvation army part to an umbrella factory she had bought another in mayfair which was sanitary convenient and in the heart of the fashionable world but was it in mayfair that her poem would be relieved of its desire pray god she thought remembering the brightness of their ladyship's eyes and the symmetry of their lordship's legs they haven't taken to reading there for that would be a thousand pities then there was lady r's the same sort of talk would be going on there still she had no doubt the gout might have shifted from the general's left leg to his right perhaps mr l might have stayed ten days with r instead of t then mr pope would come in oh but mr pope was dead who were the wits now she wondered but that was not a question one could put to a porter and so she moved on her ears were now distracted by the jingling of innumerable bells on the heads of innumerable horses. Fleets of the strangest little boxes on wheels were drawn up by the pavement. She walked out into the strand. There, the uproar was even worse. Vehicles of all sizes, drawn by blood horses and by dray horses, conveying one solitary dowager, or crowded to the top by whiskered men in silk hats, were inextricably mixed. Carriages, carts, and omnibuses seemed, to her eyes, so long used to the look of a plain sheet of fool's cap, alarmingly at loggerheads, and to her ears, attuned to a pen scratching, the uproar of the street sounded violently and hideously cacophonous. Every inch of the pavement was crowded. 
streams of people threading in and out between their own bodies and the lurching and lumbering traffic with incredible agility, poured incessantly east and west. Along the edge of the pavement stood men, holding out trays of toys, and bawled. At corners women sat beside great baskets of spring flowers and bawled. Boys, running in and out of the horses' noses, holding printed sheets to their bodies, bawled too. Disaster! Disaster! At first Orlando supposed that she had arrived at some moment of national crisis, but whether it was happy or tragic she could not tell. She looked anxiously at people's faces, but that confused her still more. Here would come by a man sunk in despair, muttering to himself as if he knew some terrible sorrow. Past him would nudge a fat, jolly-faced fellow, shouldering his way along as if it were a festival for all the world. Indeed, she came to the conclusion that there was neither rhyme nor reason in any of it. Each man and each woman was bent on his own affairs. And where was she to go? She walked on without thinking, up one street and down another, by vast windows piled with handbags and mirrors and dressing gowns, and flowers and fishing rods and luncheon baskets, while stuff of every hue and pattern, thickness or thinness, was looped and festooned and ballooned across and across. Sometimes she passed down avenues of sedate mansions, soberly numbered one, two, three, and so on, right up to two or three hundred, each the copy of the other, with two pillars and six steps, and a pair of curtains neatly drawn, and family luncheons laid on tables, and a parrot looking out of one window, and a manservant out of another, until her mind was dizzied with the monotony. Then she came to great open squares, with black, shiny, tightly buttoned statues of fat men in the middle and war-horses prancing, and columns rising, and fountains falling, and pigeons fluttering. So she walked and walked along pavements between houses until she felt very hungry, and something fluttering above her heart rebuked her with having forgotten all about it. It was her manuscript, The Oak Tree. She was confounded at her own neglect. She stopped dead where she stood. No coach was in sight. The street, which was wide and handsome, was singularly empty. Only one elderly gentleman was approaching. There was something vaguely familiar to her in his walk. As he came nearer, she felt certain that she had met him at some time or other before. But when? But where? Could it be that this gentleman, so neat, so portly, so prosperous, with a cane in his hand and a flower in his buttonhole, with a pink, plump face and combed white mustaches, could it be, yes, by Jove it was, her old, her very old friend, Nick Green? At the same time, he looked at her, remembered her, recognized her. "'The Lady Orlando!' he cried, sweeping his silk hat almost in the dust. "'Sir Nicholas!' she replied. For she was made aware intuitively by something in his bearing that the scurrilous penny aligner, who had lampooned her and many another in the time of Queen Elizabeth, was now risen in the world and become certainly a knight and doubtless a dozen other fine things into the bargain.' With another bow, he acknowledged that her conclusion was correct. He was a knight. He was a lit D. He was a professor. He was the author of a score of volumes. He was, in short, the most influential critic of the Victorian age. A violent tumult of emotion besieged her at meeting the man who had caused her years ago so much pain. 
Could this be the plaguy, restless fellow who had burned holes in her carpets and toasted cheese in the Italian fireplace and told such merry stories of Marlowe and the rest that they had seen the sun rise nine nights out of ten? He was now sprucely dressed in a gray morning suit, had a pink flower in his buttonhole, and gray suede gloves to match. But even as she marveled, he made another profound bow and asked her whether she would honor him by lunching with him? The bow was a thought overdone, perhaps, but the imitation of fine breeding was creditable. She followed him, wandering, into a superb restaurant, all red plush, white tablecloths, and silver cruets, as unlike as could be the old tavern or coffee-house with its sanded floor, its wooden benches, its bowls of punch and chocolate, and its broad sheets and spittoons. He laid his gloves neatly on the table beside him. Still she could hardly believe that he was the same man. His nails were clean where they used to be an inch long. His chin was shaved where a black beard used to sprout. He wore gold sleeve links where his ragged linen used to dip in the broth. It was not, indeed, until he had ordered the wine, which he did with a care that reminded her of his taste in Malmsey long ago, that she was convinced he was the same man. Ah, he said, heaving a little sigh, which was yet comfortable enough. Ah, my dear lady, the great days of literature are over. Marlowe, Shakespeare, Ben Jonson— those were the giants. Dryden, Pope, Addison. Those were the heroes. All, all are dead now. On whom have they left us? Tennyson, Browning, Carlyle. He threw an immense amount of scorn into his voice. The truth of it is, he said, pouring himself a glass of wine, that all our young writers are in the pay of booksellers. They turn out any trash that serves to pay their tailor's bills. It is an age, he said, helping himself to hors d'oeuvres, marked by precious conceits and wild experiments, none of which the Elizabethans would have tolerated for an instant. No, my dear lady, he continued, passing with approval, the turbot au gratin, which the waiter exhibited for his sanction. The great days are over. We live in degenerate times. We must cherish the past. Honor those writers, there are still a few left of them, who take antiquity for their model and write, not for pay, but— Here Orlando almost shouted, Glar! Indeed, she could have sworn that she had heard him say the very same things three hundred years ago. The names were different, of course, but the spirit was the same. Nick Green had not changed for all his knighthood, and yet some change there was. For while he ran on about taking Addison as one's model—it had been Cicero once, she thought—and lying in bed of a morning— which she was proud to think her pension, paid quarterly, enabled him to do, rolling the best works of the best authors round and round on one's tongue for an hour at least before setting pen to paper, so that the vulgarity of the present time and the deplorable condition of our native tongue, he had lived long in America, she believed, might be purified, while he ran on in much the same way that Green had run on three hundred years ago, she had time to ask herself, how was it, then, that he had changed? He had grown plump, that he was a man verging on seventy. He had grown sleek, literature had been a prosperous pursuit, evidently, but somehow the old, restless, uneasy vivacity had gone. His stories, brilliant as they were, were no longer quite so free and easy. He mentioned, it is true, my dear friend Pope, or my illustrious friend Addison, every other second. But he had an air of respectability about him which was depressing. 
and he preferred, it seemed, to enlighten her about the doings and sayings of her own blood relations, rather than tell her, as he used to do, scandal about the poets. Orlando was unaccountably disappointed. She had thought of literature all these years. Her seclusion, her rank, her sex must be her excuse, as something wild as the wind, hot as fire, swift as lightning, something errant, incalculable, abrupt. And behold, literature was an elderly gentleman in a gray suit talking about duchesses. The violence of her disillusionment was such that some hook or button fastening the upper part of her dress burst open, and out upon the table fell the oak tree, a poem. A manuscript, said Sir Nicholas, putting on his gold pince-nez. How interesting, how excessively interesting. Permit me to look at it. And once more, after an interval of some three hundred years, Nicholas Green took Orlando's poem, and, laying it down among the coffee cups and the liquor glasses, began to read it. But now his verdict was very different from what it had been then. It reminded him, he said as he turned over the pages, of Addison's Cato. It compared favorably with Thompson's Seasons. There was no trace in it, he was thankful to say, of the modern spirit. It was composed with a regard to truth, to nature, to the dictates of the human heart, which was rare indeed in these days of unscrupulous eccentricity. It must, of course, be published instantly. Really, Orlando did not know what he meant. She had always carried her manuscripts about with her in the bosom of her dress. The idea tickled Sir Nicholas considerably. "'But what about royalties?' he asked. Orlando's mind flew to Buckingham Palace and some dusky potentates who happened to be staying there. Sir Nicholas was highly diverted. He explained that he was alluding to the fact that Messrs. Blank, here he mentioned a well-known firm of publishers, would be delighted if he wrote them a line, to put the book on their list. He could probably arrange for a royalty of ten percent on all copies up to two thousand, after that it would be fifteen. As for the reviewers, he would himself write a line to Mr. Blank, who was the most influential, then a compliment, say, a little puff of her own poems, addressed to the wife of the editor of the Blank, never did any harm. He would call Blank. So he ran on. Orlando understood nothing of all this, and from old experience did not altogether trust his good nature, but there was nothing for it but to submit to what was evidently his wish and the fervent desire of the poem itself. So Sir Nicholas made the blood-stained packet into a neat parcel, flattened it into his breast pocket lest it should disturb the set of his coat and, with many compliments on both sides, they parted. Orlando walked up the street. Now that the poem was gone, and she felt a bare place in her breast where she had been used to carry it, she had nothing to do but reflect upon whatever she liked, the extraordinary chances it might be of the human lot. Here she was, in St. James's Street, a married woman, with a ring on her finger. Where there had been a coffee-house once, there was now a restaurant. It was about half-past three in the afternoon. The sun was shining. There were three pigeons, a mongrel terrier dog, two handsome cabs, and a barouche landau. What, then, was life? The thought popped into her head violently irrelevantly, unless old Green were somehow the cause of it. And it may be taken as a comment, adverse or favorable as the reader chooses to consider it, upon her relations with her husband, who was at the horn, that whenever anything popped violently into her head, she went straight to the nearest telegraph office and wired to him. There was one, as it happened, close at hand. 
My God, Shell, she wired. Life, literature, green, toady. Here she dropped into a cipher language which they had invented between them, so that a whole spiritual state of the utmost complexity might be conveyed in a word or two without the telegraph clerk being any the wiser, and added the words, Ratigan Glumfabu, which summed it up precisely. For not only had the events of the morning made a deep impression on her, but it cannot have escaped the reader's attention that Orlando was growing up, which is not necessarily growing better. And Ratigan Glumfabu described a very complicated spiritual state, which, if the reader puts all his intelligence at our service, he may discover for himself. There could be no answer to her telegram for some hours. Indeed, it was probable, she thought, glancing at the sky, where the upper clouds raced swiftly past, that there was a gale at Cape Horn, so that her husband would be at the masthead as likely as not, or cutting away some tattered spar, or even alone in a boat with a biscuit. And so, leaving the post office, she turned to beguile herself into the next shop which was a shop so common in our day that it needs no description, yet to her eyes strange in the extreme. A shop where they sold books. All her life long Orlando had known manuscripts, had held in her hands the rough brown sheets on which Spencer had written in his little crabbed hand. She had seen Shakespeare's script and Milton's. She owned, indeed, a fair number of quartos and folios, often with a sonnet in her praise in them, and sometimes a lock of hair. But these innumerable little volumes, bright, identical, ephemeral, for they seemed bound in cardboard and printed on tissue paper, surprised her infinitely. The whole works of Shakespeare cost half a crown and could be put in your pocket. One could hardly read them, indeed, the print was so small, but it was a marvel nonetheless. Works, the works of every writer she had known or heard of, and many more, stretched from end to end of the long shelves. On tables and chairs more works were piled and tumbled. And these she saw, turning a page or two, were often works about other works, by Sir Nicholas, and a score of others whom, in her ignorance, she supposed, since they were bound and printed, to be very great writers, too. So she gave an astounding order to the bookseller to send her everything of any importance in the shop, and left. She turned into Hyde Park, which she had known of old, Beneath that cleft tree, she remembered, the Duke of Hamilton fell, run through the body by Lord Mohun. And her lips, which are often to blame in the matter, began framing the words of her telegram into a senseless sing-song. Life, literature, green toady, radigan glumfaboo. So that several park-keepers looked at her with suspicion, and were only brought to a favorable opinion of her sanity, by noticing the pearl necklace which she wore. She had carried off a sheaf of papers and critical journals from the bookshop, and at length, flinging herself on her elbow beneath a tree, she spread these pages round her and did her best to fathom the noble art of prose composition as these masters practiced it. For still the old credulity was alive in her. Even the blurred type of a weekly newspaper had some sanctity in her eyes. So she read, lying on her elbow, an article by Sir Nicholas on the collected works of a man she had once known, John Donne. But she had pitched herself without knowing it, not far from the Serpentine. The barking of a thousand dogs sounded in her ears. Carriage wheels rushed ceaselessly in a circle round her. Leaves sighed overhead. Now and again a braided skirt and a pair of tight scarlet trousers crossed the grass within a few steps of her. Once a gigantic rubber ball bounced on the newspaper. Violets, oranges, reds, and blues broke through the interstices of the leaves and sparkled in the emerald on her finger. 
She was distracted between the two. She looked at the paper and looked up. She looked at the sky and looked down. Life? Literature? One to be made into the other? But how monstrously difficult! For here came by a pair of tight scarlet trousers. How would Addison have put that? Here came two dogs dancing on their hind legs. How would Lamb have described that? For reading Sir Nicholas and his friends, as she did in the intervals of looking about her, she somehow got the impression, here she rose and walked, they made one feel, it was an extremely uncomfortable feeling, one must never, never say what one thought. She stood on the banks of the serpentine. It was a bronze color. Spider-thin boats were skimming from side to side. They made one feel, she continued, that one must always, always write like somebody else. The tears formed themselves in her eyes. For really, she thought, pushing a little boat off with her toe, I don't think I could. Here the whole of Sir Nicholas's article came before her, as articles do, ten minutes after they are read, with the look of his room, his head, his cat, his writing-table, and the time of day thrown in. I don't think I could, she continued, considering the article from this point of view, sit in a study. No, it's not a study. It's a moldy kind of drawing-room all day long and talk to pretty young men and tell them little anecdotes, which they mustn't repeat, about what Tupper said about smiles, and then, she continued, weeping bitterly, they're all so manly, and then, I do detest duchesses, and I don't like cake, and though I'm spiteful enough, I could never learn to be as spiteful as all that, so how can I be a critic and write the best English prose of my time? Damn it all! she exclaimed, launching a penny steamer so vigorously that the poor little boat almost sank in the bronze-colored waves. Now the truth is that when one has been in a state of mind, as nurses call it, and the tears still stood in Orlando's eyes, the thing one is looking at becomes not itself but another thing, which is bigger and much more important, and yet remains the same thing. If one looks at the serpentine in this state of mind, the waves soon become just as big as the waves on the Atlantic. The toy boats become indistinguishable from ocean liners. So Orlando mistook the toy boat for her husband's brig, and the wave she had made with her toe for a mountain of water off Cape Horn. And as she watched the toy boat climb the ripple, she thought she saw Bonthrop's ship climb up and up a glassy wall, up and up it went, and a white crest with a thousand deaths in it arched over it, and through the thousand deaths it went and disappeared. It's sunk, she cried out in agony, and then, behold, there it was again sailing along safe and sound among the ducks on the other side of the Atlantic. Ecstasy! she cried. Ecstasy! Where's the post office? she wondered, for I must wire at once to Shell and tell him. And repeating, a toy boat on the serpentine, and ecstasy, alternately, for the thoughts were interchangeable, and meant exactly the same thing. She hurried towards Park Lane. A toy boat, a toy boat, a toy boat, she repeated, thus enforcing upon herself the fact that it is not articles by Nick Green on John Dunn, nor eight-hour bills, nor covenants, nor factory acts that matter. It's something useless, sudden, violent, something that costs a life. Red, blue, purple, a spurt, a splash, like those hyacinths, she was passing a fine bed of them, free from taint, dependence, soilier of humanity, or care for one's kind. Something rash, ridiculous. Like my hyacinth, husband, I mean, Bonthrop. That's what it is. A toy boat on the serpentine. It's ecstasy. Ecstasy. Thus she spoke aloud, waiting for the carriages to pass at Stanhope Gate. 
for the consequence of not living with one's husband, except when the wind is sunk, is that one talks nonsense aloud in Park Lane. It would no doubt have been different had she lived all the year round with him, as Queen Victoria recommended. As it was, the thought of him would come upon her in a flash. She found it absolutely necessary to speak to him instantly. She did not care in the least what nonsense it might make, or what dislocation it might inflict on the narrative. Nick Green's article had plunged her in the depths of despair. The toy boat had raised her to the heights of joy. So she repeated, "'Ecstasy! Ecstasy!' as she stood waiting to cross. But the traffic was heavy that spring afternoon, and kept her standing there, repeating ecstasy, ecstasy, or a toy boat on the serpentine, while the wealth and power of England sat as if sculptured in hat and cloak, in foreign hand, Victoria and Baruch Landau. It was as if a golden river had coagulated and massed itself in golden blocks, across Park Lane. The ladies held card-cases between their fingers. The gentlemen balanced gold-mounted canes between their knees. She stood there, gazing, admiring, awestruck. One thought only disturbed her, a thought familiar to all who behold great elephants, or whales of an incredible magnitude, and that is, how do these leviathans, to whom obviously stress change and activity, are repugnant, propagate their kind. Perhaps, Orlando thought, looking at the stately, still faces, their time of propagation is over. This is the fruit. This is the consummation. What she now beheld was the triumph of an age. Portly and splendid, there they sat. But now the policeman let fall his hand, the stream became liquid, the massive conglomeration of splendid objects moved, dispersed, and disappeared into Piccadilly. So she crossed Park Lane, and went to her house in Curzon Street, where, when the meadow sweet blew there, she could remember Curlew calling, and one very old man with a gun. She could remember, she thought, stepping across the threshold of her house how Lord Chesterfield had said, but her memory was checked. Her discreet eighteenth-century hall, where she could see Lord Chesterfield putting his hat down here and his coat down there with an elegance of deportment which it was a pleasure to watch, was now completely littered with parcels. While she had been sitting in Hyde Park, the bookseller had delivered her order, and the house was crammed. There were parcels slipping down the staircase, with the whole of Victorian literature done up in grey paper and neatly tied with string. She carried as many of these packets as she could to her room, ordered footmen to bring the others, and, rapidly cutting innumerable strings, was soon surrounded by innumerable volumes. Accustomed to the little literatures of the sixteenth 17th and 18th centuries, Orlando was appalled by the consequences of her order. For, of course, to the Victorians themselves, Victorian literature meant not merely four great names separate and distinct, but four great names sunk and embedded in a mass of Alexander Smiths, Dixons, Blacks, Millmans, Buckles, Taines, Paynes, Tuppers, Jamesons, all vocal, clamorous, prominent, and requiring as much attention as anybody else. Orlando's reverence for print had a tough job set before it, but drawing her chair to the window to get the benefit of what light might filter between the high houses of Mayfair, she tried to come to a conclusion. And now it is clear that there are only two ways of coming to a conclusion upon Victorian literature. One is to write it out in sixty volumes octavo. The other is to squeeze it into six lines of the length of this one. Of the two courses, economy, since time runs short, leads us to choose the second, and so we proceed. Orlando then came to the conclusion, 
opening half a dozen books, that it was very odd that there was not a single dedication to a nobleman among them. Next, turning over a vast pile of memoirs, that several of these writers had family trees half as high as her own. Next, that it would be impolitic in the extreme to wrap a ten-pound note round the sugar-tongs when Miss Christina Rossetti came to tea. Next, here were half a dozen invitations to celebrate centenaries by dining. That literature, since it ate all these dinners, must be growing very corpulent. Next, she was invited to a score of lectures upon the influence of this upon that, the classic revival, the romantic survival, and other titles of the same engaging kind. That literature, since it listened to all these lectures, must be growing very dry. Next, here she attended a reception given by a peeress, that literature, since it wore all these fur tippets, must be growing very respectable. Next, here she visited Carlyle's soundproof room at Chelsea, that genius, since it needed all this coddling, must be growing very delicate. And so at last she reached her final conclusion, which was of the highest importance, but which, as we have already much overpassed our limit of six lines, we must omit. Orlando, having come to this conclusion, stood looking out of the window for a considerable space of time. For when anybody comes to a conclusion, it is as if they had tossed the ball over the net, and must wait for the unseen antagonist to return it to them. What would be sent her next from the colorless sky above Chesterfield House, she wondered. And with her hands clasped, she stood for a considerable space of time, wondering. Suddenly she started, and here we could only wish that, as on a former occasion, purity, chastity, and modesty would push the door ajar and provide at least a breathing space in which we could think how to wrap up what now has to be told delicately, as a biographer should. But no, having thrown their white garment at the naked Orlando and seen it fall short by several inches, these ladies had given up all intercourse with her these many years and were now otherwise engaged. Is nothing, then, going to happen this pale March morning, to mitigate, to veil, to cover, to conceal, to shroud this undeniable event, whatever it may be? For after giving that sudden, violent start, Orlando, but heaven be praised, at this very moment, there struck up outside one of these frail, reedy, fluty, jerky, old-fashioned barrel organs, which are still sometimes played by Italian organ grinders in back streets. Let us accept the intervention, humble though it is, as if it were the music of the spheres, and allow it, with all its gasps and groans, to fill this page with sound until the moment comes which it is impossible to deny is coming, which the footman has seen coming and the maidservant. And the reader will have to see, too, for Orlando herself is clearly unable to ignore it any longer. Let the barrel organ sound and transport us on thought, which is no more than a little boat, when music sounds, tossing on the waves, on thought, which is of all carriers the most clumsy, the most erratic, over the rooftops and the back gardens where washing is hanging to— What is this place? Do you recognize the green, and in the middle the steeple, and the gates with a lion couchant on either side? Oh, yes, it is Q. Well— Q will do. So here, then, we are at Q, and I will show you today, the 2nd of March, under the plum tree, a grape hyacinth, and a crocus, and a bud, too, on the almond tree, so that to walk there is to be thinking of bulbs, hairy and red, thrust into the earth in October, flowering now, and to be dreaming of more than can rightly be said, and to be taking from its case a cigarette, or cigar, even and to be flinging a cloak under, as the rhyme requires, an oak, and there to sit wading the kingfisher, which, it is said, was seen once to cross in the evening from bank to bank. Wait, wait, the kingfisher comes. The kingfisher comes not. 
Behold, meanwhile, the factory chimneys and their smoke. Behold the city clerks flashing by in their outrigger. Behold the old lady taking her dog for a walk, and the servant girl wearing her new hat for the first time, not at the right angle. Behold them all. Though heaven has mercifully decreed that the secrets of all hearts are hidden, so that we are lured on forever to suspect something, perhaps, that does not exist, still through our cigarette smoke we see blaze up and salute the splendid fulfillment of natural desires for a hat, for a boat, for a rat in a ditch, as once one saw blazing. Such silly hops and skips the mind takes when it slops like this all over the saucer and the barrel organ plays. Saw blazing a fire in a field against the minarets near Constantinople. Hail, natural desire! Hail, happiness, divine happiness, and pleasure of all sorts, flowers and wine, though one fades and the other intoxicates and half-crown tickets out of London on Sundays, and singing in a dark chapel hymns about death, and anything, anything that interrupts and confounds the tapping of typewriters, and filing of letters, and forging of links and chains binding the empire together. Hail even the crude red bows on shop-girls' lips, as if Cupid very clumsily dipped his thumb in red ink and scrawled a token in passing. Hail, happiness, kingfisher flashing from bank to bank, and all fulfillment of natural desire, whether it is what the male novelist says it is, or prayer, or denial, hail, in whatever form it comes, and may there be more forms and stranger. For dark flows the stream, would it were true, as the rhyme hints, like a dream, but duller and worser than that is our usual lot without dreams, but alive, smug, fluent, habitual, under trees whose shade of an olive green drowns the blue of the wing of the vanishing bird when he darts of a sudden from bank to bank. Hail happiness, then, and after happiness, hail not those dreams which bloat the sharp image as spotted mirrors do the face in a country inn parlor. Dreams which splinter the whole and tear us asunder and wound us and split us apart in the night when we would sleep, but sleep, sleep, so deep that all shapes are ground to dust of infinite softness, water of dimness inscrutable, and there, folded, shrouded like a mummy, like a moth, prone let us lie on the sand at the bottom of sleep. But wait, but wait! We are not going this time, visiting the blind land. Blue, like a match struck right in the ball of the innermost eye, he flies, burns, bursts the seal of sleep, the kingfisher, so that now floods back, refluent like a tide, the red, thick stream of life again, bubbling, dripping. And we rise, and our eyes, for how handy a rhyme is to pass us safe over the awkward transition from death to life, fall on. Here the barrel organ stops playing abruptly. It's a very fine boy, milady," said Mrs. Banting, the midwife. In other words, Orlando was safely delivered of a son on Thursday, March the 20th, at three o'clock in the morning. End of section 10. Section 11 of Orlando, a Biography by Virginia Woolf. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 6, Part 2. Once more Orlando stood at the window, but let the reader take courage. Nothing of the same sort is going to happen today, which is not, by any means, the same day. No, for if we look out of the window, as Orlando was doing at the moment, we shall see that Park Lane itself has considerably changed. Indeed, one might stand there ten minutes or more, as Orlando stood now, without seeing a single Barouche Landau. "'Look at that!' she exclaimed, 
Some days later, when an absurd truncated carriage without any horses began to glide about of its own accord. A carriage without any horses, indeed! She was called away just as she said that, but came back again after a time, and had another look out of the window. It was odd sort of weather nowadays. The sky itself, she could not help thinking, had changed. It was no longer so thick, so watery, so prismatic, now that King Edward, see, there he was, stepping out of his neat brougham to go and visit a certain lady opposite, had succeeded Queen Victoria. The clouds had shrunk to a thin gauze, the sky seemed made of metal, which in hot weather tarnished verdigris, copper color, or orange, as metal does in a fog. It was a little alarming, this shrinkage. Everything seemed to have shrunk. Driving past Buckingham Palace last night, there was not a trace of that vast erection which she had thought everlasting. Top hats, widow's weeds, trumpets, telescopes, wreaths, all had vanished and left not a stain, not a puddle even, on the pavement. But it was now... After another interval, she had come back again to her favorite station in the window, now, in the evening, that the change was most remarkable. Look at the lights in the houses. At a touch, a whole room was lit, hundreds of rooms were lit, and one was precisely the same as the other. One could see everything in the little square-shaped boxes. There was no privacy. None of those lingering shadows and odd corners that there used to be. None of those women in aprons carrying wobbly lamps, which they put down carefully on this table and on that. At a touch the whole room was bright, and the sky was bright all night long, and the pavements were bright, everything was bright. She came back again at midday. How narrow women had grown lately! They looked like stalks of corn, straight, shining, identical. And men's faces were as bare as the palm of one's hand. The dryness of the atmosphere brought out the color in everything and seemed to stiffen the muscles of the cheeks. It was harder to cry now. People were much gayer. Water was hot in two seconds. Ivy had perished or been scraped off houses. Vegetables were less fertile. Families were much smaller. Curtains and covers had been frizzled up, and the walls were bare so that new, brilliantly colored pictures of real things like streets, umbrellas, apples, were hung in frames or painted upon the wood. There was something definite and distinct about the age which reminded her of the eighteenth century, except that there was a distraction, a desperation. As she was thinking this, the immensely long tunnel in which she seemed to have been traveling for hundreds of years widened, the light poured in, her thoughts became mysteriously tightened and strung up, as if a piano tuner had put his key in her back and stretched the nerves very taut. At the same time, her hearing quickened. She could hear every whisper and crackle in the room so that the clock ticking on the mantelpiece beat like a hammer. And so, for some seconds, the light went on becoming brighter and brighter, and she saw everything more and more clearly, and the clock ticked louder and louder, until there was a terrific explosion right in her ear. Orlando leapt as if she had been violently struck on the head. Ten times she was struck. In fact, it was ten o'clock in the morning. It was the 11th of October. It was 1928. It was the present moment. No one need wonder that Orlando started, pressed her hand to her heart, and turned pale. For what more terrifying revelation can there be than that it is the present moment? That we survive the shock at all is only possible because the past shelters us on one side, the future on another. 
But we have no time now for reflections. Orlando was terribly late already. She ran downstairs, jumped into her motor car, pressed the self-starter, and was off. Vast blue blocks of building rose into the air. The red cowls of chimneys were spotted irregularly across the sky. The road shone like silver-headed nails. Omnibuses bore down upon her with sculptured white-faced drivers. She noticed sponges, bird cages, boxes of green American cloth. But she did not allow these sights to sink into her mind even the fraction of an inch as she crossed the narrow plank of the present, lest she should fall into the raging torrent beneath. Why don't you look where you're going to? Put your hand out, can't you? That was all she said, sharply, as if the words were jerked out of her, for the streets were immensely crowded. People crossed without looking where they were going. People buzzed and hummed round the plate-glass windows, within which one could see a glow of red, a blaze of yellow, as if they were bees, Orlando thought. But her thought that they were bees was violently snipped off, and she saw, regaining perspective with one flick of her eye, that they were bodies. "'Why don't you look where you're going?' she snapped out. At last, however, she drew up at Marshall and Snellgrove's and went into the shop. Shade and scent enveloped her. The present fell from her like drops of scalding water. Light swayed up and down like thin stuffs puffed out by a summer breeze. She took a list from her bag and began reading in a curious, stiff voice at first, as if she were holding the words, boys' boots, bath salts, sardines, under a tap of many-colored water. She watched them change as the light fell on them. Bath and boots became blunt, obtuse. Sardines serrated itself like a saw. So she stood in the ground-floor department of Messrs. Marshall and Snellgrove, looked this way and that, snuffed this smell and that, and thus wasted some seconds. Then she got into the lift, for the good reason that the door stood open, and was shot smoothly upwards. The very fabric of life now, she thought as she rose, is magic. In the eighteenth century we knew how everything was done, but here I rise through the air. I listen to voices in America. I see men flying. But how it's done I can't even begin to wonder. So my belief in magic returns. Now the lift gave a little jerk as it stopped at the first floor, and she had a vision of innumerable colored stuffs flaunting in a breeze from which came distinct, strange smells. And each time the lift stopped and flung its doors open, there was another slice of the world displayed with all the smells of that world clinging to it. She was reminded of the river off Wapping in the time of Elizabeth where the treasure ships and the merchant ships used to anchor, how richly and curiously they had smelt, how well she remembered the feel of rough rubies running through her fingers when she dabbed them in a treasure sack, and then lying with Suki, or whatever her name was, and having Cumberland's lantern flashed on them. The Cumberlands had a house in Portland Place now, and she had lunched with them the other day and ventured a little joke with the old man about almshouses and the Sheen Road. He had winked. But here, as the lift could go no higher, she must get out. Heaven knows into what department, as they called it. She stood still to consult her shopping list, but was blessed if she could see, as the list bade her, bath salts or boys' boots anywhere about. And indeed, she was about to descend again without buying anything, but was saved from that outrage by saying aloud automatically the last item on her list, which happened to be sheets for a double bed. Sheets for a double bed, she said to a man at a counter, and, by a dispensation of providence, it was sheets that the man at that particular counter happened to sell. For Grimsditch, no, Grimstitch was dead. Bartholomew. No, Bartholomew was dead. Louise, then. 
Louise had come to her in a great taking the other day, for she had found a hole in the bottom of the sheet in the royal bed. Many kings and queens had slept there, Elizabeth, James, Charles, George, Victoria, Edward. No wonder the sheet had a hole in it. But Louise was positive she knew who had done it. It was the Prince Consort. Zilla Bosch, she said, for there had been another war, this time against the Germans. Sheets for a double bed, Orlando repeated dreamily for a double bed with a silver counterpane in a room fitted in a taste which she now thought perhaps a little vulgar, all in silver, but she had furnished it when she had a passion for that metal. While the man went to get sheets for a double bed, she took out a little looking-glass and a powder puff. Women were not nearly as roundabout in their ways, she thought, powdering herself with the greatest unconcern as they had been when she herself first turned woman and lay on the deck of the enamoured lady. She gave her nose the right tint, deliberately. She never touched her cheeks. Honestly, though she was now thirty-six, she scarcely looked a day older. She looked just as pouting, as sulky, as handsome, as rosy, like a million-candled Christmas tree, Sasha had said as she had done that day on the ice, when the Thames was frozen and they had gone skating. "'The best Irish linen, ma'am,' said the shopman, spreading the sheets on the counter. And they had met an old woman picking up sticks. Here, as she was fingering the linen abstractedly, one of the swing-doors between the departments opened and let through, perhaps from the fancy goods department, a whiff of scent, waxen, tinted as if from pink candles, and the scent curved like a shell round a figure. Was it a boy's, or was it a girl's? Furred, pearled, in Russian trousers, young, slender, seductive, a girl, by God, but faithless, 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 cried Orlando. The man had gone, and all the shop seemed to pitch and toss with yellow water and far off she saw the masts of the Russian ships standing out to sea, and then, miraculously, perhaps the door opened again, the conch which the scent had made became a platform, a dais, off which stepped a fat, furred woman, marvelously well preserved, seductive, diademed, a grand duke's mistress, she who, leaning over the banks of the Volga, eating sandwiches, had watched men drown, and began walking down the shop toward her. "'Oh, Sasha!' Orlando cried. Really, she was shocked that she should have come to this. She had grown so fat, so lethargic, and she bowed her head over the linen, so that this apparition of a grey woman in fur, and a girl in Russian trousers with all these smells of wax candles, white flowers, and Russian sailors that it brought with it, might pass behind her back unseen. "'Any napkins, towels, dusters to-day, ma'am?' the shopman persisted. And it is enormously to the credit of the shopping list, which Orlando now consulted, that she was able to reply with every appearance of composure, that there was only one thing in the world she wanted, and that was bath salts, which was in another department. But descending in the lift again, so insidious is the repetition of any scene. She was again sunk far beneath the present moment, and thought, when the lift bumped on the ground, that she heard a pot broken against a river bank. As for finding the right department, whatever it might be, she stood engrossed among the handbags, deaf to the suggestions of all the polite, black, combed, sprightly shop assistants, who, descending as they did equally, and some of them perhaps as proudly, even from such depths of the past as she did, chose to let down the impervious screen of the present, so that to-day they appeared shop assistants in Marshall and Snellgroves merely. Orlando stood there hesitating. Through the great glass door she could see the traffic in Oxford Street. Omnibus seemed to pile itself upon omnibus and then to jerk itself apart. 
So the ice blocks had pitched and tossed that day on the Thames. An old nobleman in furred slippers had sat astride one of them. There he went. She could see him now, calling down maledictions upon the Irish rebels. He had sunk there, where her car stood. Time has passed over me, she thought, trying to collect herself. This is the oncome of middle age. How strange it is! Nothing is any longer one thing. I take up a handbag, and I think of an old bumboat woman frozen in the ice. Someone lights a pink candle, and I see a girl in Russian trousers. When I step out of doors, as I do now, here she stepped onto the pavement of Oxford Street, what is it that I taste? Little herbs. I hear goat bells. I see mountains. Turkey? India? Persia? Her eyes filled with tears. That Orlando had gone a little too far from the present moment will perhaps strike the reader, who sees her now preparing to get into her motor car, with her eyes full of tears and visions of Persian mountains. And indeed it cannot be denied that the most successful practitioners of the art of life, often unknown people, by the way, somehow contrive to synchronize the sixty or seventy different times which beat simultaneously in every normal human system, so that when eleven strikes, all the rest chime in unison. And the present is neither a violent disruption, nor completely forgotten in the past. Of them we can justly say that they live precisely the sixty-eight or seventy-two years allotted them on the tombstone. Of the rest, some we know to be dead, though they walk among us. Some are not yet born, though they go through the forms of life. Others are hundreds of years old, though they call themselves thirty-six. The true length of a person's life, whatever the Dictionary of National Biography may say, is always a matter of dispute. Indeed, it is a difficult business, this timekeeping. Nothing more quickly disorders it than contact with any of the arts, and it may have been her love of poetry that was to blame, for making Orlando lose her shopping list and start home without the sardines, the bath salts, or the boots. Now as she stood with her hand on the door of her motor car, the present again struck her on the head. Eleven times she was violently assaulted. "'Confound it all!' she cried, for it is a great shock to the nervous system, hearing a clock strike, so much so that for some time now there is nothing to be said of her save that she frowned slightly, changed her gears admirably, and cried out as before, "'Look where you're going! Don't you know your own mind? Why didn't you say so, then?' While the motor-car shot, swung, squeezed, and slid, for she was an expert driver, down Regent Street, down Haymarket, down Northumberland Avenue, over Westminster Bridge, to the left, straight on, to the right, straight on again. The old Kent Road was very crowded on Thursday, the 11th of October, 1928. People spilt off the pavement. There were women with shopping bags. Children ran out. There were sales at drapers' shops. Streets widened and narrowed. Long vistas steadily shrunk together. Here was a market, here a funeral, here a procession with banners upon which was written in great letters, Ra, Un, but what else? Meat was very red. Butchers stood at the door. Women almost had their heels sliced off. A Morvan, that was over a porch. A woman looked out of a bedroom window, profoundly contemplative and very still. Applejohn and Applebed under t Nothing could be seen whole or red from start to finish. What was seen begun, like two friends starting to meet each other across the street, was never seen ended. 
After twenty minutes the body and mind were like scraps of torn paper tumbling from a sack, and, indeed, the process of motoring fast out of London so much resembles the chopping up small of body and mind, which precedes unconsciousness, and perhaps death itself, that it is an open question in what sense Orlando can be said to have existed at the present moment. Indeed, we should have given her over for a person entirely disassembled, were it not that here, at last, one green screen was held out on the right, against which the little bits of paper fell more slowly, and then another was held out on the left, so that one could see the separate scraps now turning over by themselves in the air, and then green screens were held continuously on either side, so that her mind regained the illusion of holding things within itself, and she saw a cottage, a farmyard, and four cows, all precisely life-size. When this happened, Orlando heaved a sigh of relief, lit a cigarette, and puffed for a minute or two in silence. Then she called hesitatingly, as if the person she wanted might not be there. Orlando? For if there are, at a venture, seventy-six different times all ticking in the mind at once, how many different people are there not, heaven help us, all having lodgment at one time or another in the human spirit? Some say two thousand and fifty-two so that it is the most usual thing in the world for a person to say, directly they are alone, Orlando, if that is one's name, meaning by that, come, come, I'm sick to death of this particular self, I want another. Hence the astonishing changes we see in our friends. But it is not altogether plain sailing either, for though one may say, as Orlando said, being out in the country and needing another self, presumably, Orlando? Still the Orlando she needs may not come. These selves of which we are built up, one on top of another, as plates are piled on a waiter's hand, have attachments elsewhere, sympathies, little constitutions and rights of their own, call them what you will, and for many of these things there is no name so that one will only come if it is raining, another in a room with green curtains, another when Mrs. Jones is not there, another if you can promise it a glass of wine, and so on. For everybody can multiply from his own experience the different terms which his different selves have made with him, and some are too wildly ridiculous to be mentioned in print at all. So Orlando, at the turn by the barn, called, Orlando, with a note of interrogation in her voice, and waited. Orlando did not come. All right, then, Orlando said, with the good humor people practice on these occasions, and tried another, for she had a great variety of selves to call upon, far more than we have been able to find room for, since a biography is considered complete, if it merely accounts for six or seven selves, whereas a person may well have as many thousand. Choosing, then, only those selves we have found room for, Orlando may now have called on the boy who cut the nigger's head down, the boy who strung it up again, the boy who sat on the hill, the boy who saw the poet, the boy who handed the queen the bowl of rose-water. Or she may have called upon the young man who fell in love with Sasha, or upon the courtier, or upon the ambassador, or upon the soldier, or upon the traveller. Or she may have wanted the woman to come to her, the gypsy, the fine lady, the hermit, the girl in love with life, the patroness of letters, the woman who called Mar, meaning hot baths and evening fires, or Shelmerdine, meaning crocuses in autumn woods, or Bonthrop, meaning the death we die daily, or all three together, which meant more things than we have space to write out. All these selves were different, and she may have called upon any one of them. Perhaps. But what appeared certain, 
for we are now in the region of perhaps and appears, was that the one she needed most kept aloof, for she was, to hear her talk, changing her cells as quickly as she drove. There was a new one at every corner. As happens when, for some unaccountable reason, the conscious self, which is the uppermost and has the power to desire, wishes to be nothing but one self. This is what some people call the true self, and it is, they say, compact of all the selves we have it in us to be, commanded and locked up by the captain's self, the key self, which amalgamates and controls them all. Orlando was currently seeking this self, as the reader can judge from overhearing her talk as she drove, and if it is rambling talk, disconnected, trivial, dull, and sometimes unintelligible, it is the reader's fault for listening to a lady talking to herself. We only copy her words as she spoke them, adding in brackets which self, in our opinion, is speaking. But in this we may well be wrong. "'What, then? Who, then?' she said. Thirty-six, in a motor-car, a woman. Yes, but a million other things as well. A snob am I. The garter and the hall? The leopards? My ancestors? Proud of them? Yes. Greedy, luxurious, vicious, am I?' Here a new self came in. "'Don't care a damn if I am. Truthful? I think so.' Generous? Oh, but that don't count. Here a new self came in. Lying in bed of a morning on fine linen. Listening to the pigeons. Silver dishes. Wine. Maids. Footmen. Spoilt? Perhaps. Here another self came in. My books. Here she mentioned fifty classical titles, which represented, so we think, the early romantic works that she tore up. Facile, glib, romantic, but— Here another self came in. A duffer, a fumbler, more clumsy I couldn't be, and— And— Here she hesitated for a word, and if we suggest love, we may be wrong. But certainly she laughed and blushed, and then cried out, A toad set in emeralds, Harry the Archduke, blue bottles on the ceiling— here another self came in. But Nell? Kit? Sasha? She was sunk in gloom. Tears actually shaped themselves, and she had long given over crying. Trees, she said. She was passing a clump. Here another self came in. I love trees. Trees growing there a thousand years. And barns. She passed a tumble-down barn at the edge of the road. And sheep-dogs! Here one came trotting across the road. She carefully avoided it. And the night! But people! Here another self came in. People? She repeated it as a question. Chattering, spiteful, always telling lies. Here she turned into the high street of her native town, which was crowded, for it was market day, with farmers and shepherds and old women with hens in baskets. Peasants I like. I understand crops, but— Here another self came skipping over the top of her mind, like the beam from a lighthouse. Fame! she laughed. Fame! Seven editions! A prize! photographs in the evening papers. Here she alluded to the oak tree and the Burdett Coutts Memorial Prize, which she had won, and we must here snatch time to remark how discomposing it is for her biographer that this culmination and peroration should be dashed from us on a laugh casually like this. But the truth is that when we write of a woman everything is out of place, culminations and perorations. The accent never falls where it does with a man. Fame, she repeated. A poet, a charlatan, both every morning as regularly as the post comes in. To dine, to meet, to meet, to dine, fame, fame. She had here to slow down to pass through the crowd of market people, but no one noticed her. 
a porpoise in a fishmonger's shop attracted far more attention than a lady who had won a prize and might, had she chosen, have worn three coronets, one on top of another, on her brow. Driving very slowly, she now hummed as if it were part of an old song. With my guineas I'll buy flowering trees, flowering trees, flowering trees, and walk among my flowering trees, and tell my sons what fame is. So she hummed, and now all her words began to sag here and there. Another self came in, like a barbaric necklace of heavy beads. And walk among my flowering trees, she sang, and see the moon rise slow, the wagons go. Here she stopped short, and looked ahead of her intently at the bonnet of the car in profound meditation. He sat at Twitchett's table, she mused, with a dirty ruff on. Was it old Mr. Baker come to measure the timber? Or was it sh <sighs> For when we speak names we deeply reverence to ourselves, we never speak them whole. She gazed for ten minutes ahead of her, letting the car come almost to a standstill. Haunted, she cried, suddenly pressing the accelerator. Haunted, ever since I was a child. There flies the wild goose. It flies past the window out to sea. Up I jumped. She gripped the steering wheel tighter and stretched after it. But the goose flies too fast. I've seen it here, there, there, England, Persia, Italy. Always it flies fast out to sea, and always I fling after it words like nets. Here she flung her hand out which shrivel as I have seen nets shrivel drawn on deck with only seaweed in them. And sometimes there's an inch of silver, six words, in the bottom of the net, but never the great fish who lives in the coral groves. Here she bent her head, pondering deeply. And it was at this moment, when she had ceased to call Orlando, and was deep in thoughts of something else, that the Orlando whom she had called came of its own accord, as was proved by the change that now came over her as she passed through the lodge gates into the park. The whole of her darkened and settled as when some foil, whose addition makes the round and solidity of a surface, is added to it, and the shallow becomes deep, and the near distant, and all is contained as water is contained by the sides of a well. So she was now darkened, stilled, and become, with the addition of this Orlando, what is called, rightly or wrongly, a single self, a real self. And she fell silent. For it is probable that when people talk aloud, the selves, of which there may be more than two thousand, are conscious of disseverment and are trying to communicate. But when communication is established, there is nothing more to be said. Masterfully, swiftly, she drove up the curving drive between the elms and oaks through the falling turf of the park whose fall was so gentle that had it been water, it would have spread the beach with a smooth green tide. Planted here and in solemn groups were beech trees and oak trees. The deer stepped among them, one white as snow, another with its head on one side for some wire netting had caught in its horns. All this, the trees, deer, and turf, she observed with the greatest satisfaction, as if her mind had become a fluid that flowed round things and enclosed them completely. Next minute she drew up in the courtyard where, for so many hundred years she had come, on horseback, or in coach and six, with men riding before or coming after, where plumes had tossed, torches flashed, and the same flowering trees that let their leaves drop now had shaken their blossoms. Now she was alone. The autumn leaves were falling. The porter opened the great gates. "'Morning, James,' she said, 
There's some things in the car. Will you bring them in? Words of no beauty, interest, or significance in themselves, it will be conceded, but now so plumped out with meaning that they fell like ripe nuts from a tree and proved that when the shriveled skin of the ordinary is stuffed out with meaning, it satisfies the senses amazingly. This was true indeed of every movement and action now, usual though they were, so that to see Orlando change her skirt for a pair of whipcord breeches and leather jacket, which she did in less than three minutes, was to be ravished with the beauty of movement, as if Madame Lopakova were using her highest art. Then she strode into the dining-room, where her old friends Dryden, Pope, Swift, Addison, regarded her demurely at first, as who should say, here's the prize-winner. But when they reflected that two hundred guineas was in question, they nodded their heads approvingly. Two hundred guineas, they seemed to say. Two hundred guineas are not to be sniffed at. She cut herself a slice of bread and ham, clapped the two together, and began to eat, striding up and down the room, thus shedding her company habits in a second without thinking. After five or six such turns, she tossed off a glass of red Spanish wine, and, filling another which she carried in her hand, strode down the long corridor and through a dozen drawing-rooms, and so began a perambulation of the house, attended by such elk-hounds and spaniels as chose to follow her. This, too, was all in the day's routine. As soon would she come home and leave her own grandmother without a kiss, as come back and leave the house unvisited. She fancied that the rooms brightened as she came in, stirred, opened their eyes as if they had been dozing in her absence. She fancied, too, that hundreds and thousands of times as she had seen them, they never looked the same twice. As if so long a life as theirs had been, had stored in them a myriad moods which changed with winter and summer, bright weather and dark, and her own fortunes and the people's characters who visited them. Polite, they always were to strangers, but a little weary. With her they were entirely open and at their ease. Why not, indeed? They had known each other close on four centuries now. They had nothing to conceal. She knew their sorrows and joys. She knew what age each part of them was and its little secrets. A hidden drawer, a concealed cupboard, or some deficiency, perhaps, such as a part made up or added later. They, too, knew her in all her moods and changes. She had hidden nothing from them, had come to them as a child, as man, crying and dancing, brooding and gay. In this window-seat she had written her first verses. In that chapel she had been married. And she would be buried here, she reflected, kneeling on the window-sill in the long gallery and sipping her Spanish wine. Though she could hardly fancy it, the body of the heraldic leopard would be making yellow pools on the floor the day they lowered her to lie among her ancestors. She, who believed in no immortality, could not help feeling that her soul would come and go forever with the reds on the panels and the greens on the sofa. For the room, she had strolled into the ambassador's bedroom, shone like a shell that has lain at the bottom of the sea for centuries, and has been crusted over and painted a million tints by the water. It was rose and yellow, green and sand-colored. It was frail as a shell, as iridescent and as empty. No ambassador would ever sleep there again. Ah, but she knew where the heart of the house still beat. Gently opening a door, she stood on the threshold so that, as she fancied, the room could not see her, and watched the tapestry rising and falling on the eternal faint breeze which never failed to move it. Still the hunter rode, still Daphne flew, 
The heart still beat, she thought, however faint, however far withdrawn, the frail, indomitable heart of the immense building. Now, calling her troop of dogs to her, she passed down the gallery whose floor was laid with oak trees sawn across. Rows of chairs with all their velvets faded stood ranged against the wall, holding their arms out for Elizabeth, for James, for Shakespeare it might be, for Cecil, who never came. The sight made her gloomy. She unhooked the rope that fenced them off. She sat on the Queen's chair. She opened a manuscript book lying on Lady Betty's table. She stirred her fingers in the aged rose leaves. She brushed her short hair with King James's silver brushes. She bounced up and down upon his bed, but no king would ever sleep there again for all Louise's new sheets and pressed her cheek against the worn silver counterpane that lay upon it. But everywhere were little lavender bags to keep the moth out, and printed notices, Please do not touch, which, though she had put them there herself, seemed to rebuke her. The house was no longer hers entirely, she sighed. It belonged to time now, to history, was past the touch and control of the living. Never would beer be spilt here any more, she thought. She was in the bedroom that had been old Nick Green's, or holes burnt in the carpet. Never two hundred servants come running and brawling down the corridors, with warming pans and great branches for the great fireplaces. Never would ale be brewed and candles made and saddles fashioned and stones shaped in the workshops outside the house. Hammers and mallets were silent now. Chairs and beds were empty. Tankards of silver and gold were locked in glass cases. The great wings of silence beat up and down the empty house. So she sat at the end of the gallery with her dogs couched round her, in Queen Elizabeth's hard armchair. The gallery stretched far away to a point where the light almost failed. It was as a tunnel bored deep into the past. As her eyes peered down it, she could see people laughing and talking. The great men she had known, Dryden, Swift, and Pope, and statesmen in colloquy, and lovers dallying in the window seats, and people eating and drinking at the long tables and the wood smoke curling round their heads and making them sneeze and cough. Still further down, she saw sets of splendid dancers form for the quadrille. A fluty, frail, but nevertheless stately music began to play. An organ boomed. A coffin was borne into the chapel. A marriage procession came out of it. Armed men with helmets left for the wars. They brought banners back from Flodden and Poitiers and stuck them on the wall. The long gallery filled itself thus, and still peering further, she thought she could make out at the very end, beyond the Elizabethans and the Tudors, someone older, further, darker, a cowled figure, monastic, severe a monk who went with his hands clasped, and a book in them, murmuring. Like thunder the stable clock struck four. Never did any earthquake so demolish a whole town. The gallery and all its occupants fell to powder. Her own face, that had been dark and somber as she gazed, was lit as by an explosion of gunpowder. In this same light, Everything near her showed with extreme distinctness. She saw two flies circling round, and noticed the blue sheen on their bodies. She saw a knot in the wood where her foot was, and her dog's ear twitching. At the same time she heard a bough creaking in the garden, a sheep coughing in the park, a swift screaming past the window. Her own body quivered and tingled as if suddenly stood naked in a hard frost. Yet she kept, 
as she had not done when the clock struck ten in London, complete composure, for she was now one and entire, and presented, it may be, a larger surface to the shock of time. She rose, but without precipitation, called her dogs, and went firmly, but with great alertness of movement, down the staircase and out into the garden. Here the shadows of the plants were miraculously distinct. She noticed the separate grains of earth in the flower-beds, as if she had a microscope stuck to her eye. She saw the intricacy of the twigs of every tree. Each blade of grass was distinct, and the markings of veins and petals. She saw Stubbs, the gardener, coming along the path, and every button on his gaiters. She saw Betty and Prince, the cart-horses, and never had she marked so clearly the white star on Betty's forehead and the three long hairs that fell down below the rest on Prince's tail. Out in the quadrangle the old grey walls of the house looked like a scraped new photograph. She heard the loudspeaker condensing on the terrace a dance tune that people were listening to in the Red Velvet Opera House at Vienna. Braced and strung up by the present moment, she was also strangely afraid, as if every time the gulf of time gaped and let a second through, some unknown danger might come with it. The tension was too relentless and too rigorous to be endured long without discomfort. She walked more briskly than she liked, as if her legs were moved for her through the garden and out into the park. Here she forced herself by a great effort to stop by the carpenter's shop, and to stand stock still watching Joe Stubbs fashion a cartwheel. She was standing with her eye fixed on his hand when the quarter struck. It hurtled through her like a meteor, so hot that no fingers can hold it. She saw with disgusting vividness that the thumb on Joe's right hand was without a fingernail, and there was a raised saucer of pink flesh where the nail should have been. The sight was so repulsive that she felt faint for a moment, but in that moment's darkness, when her eyelids flickered, she was relieved of the pressure of the present. There was something strange in the shadow that the flicker of her eyes cast, something which, as any one can test for himself by looking now at the sky, is always absent from the present, whence its terror, its nondescript character, something one trembles to pin through the body with a name and call beauty, for it has no body is as a shadow and without substance or quality of its own, yet has the power to change whatever it adds itself to. This shadow now, while she flickered her eye in her faintness in the carpenter's shop, stole out, and, attaching itself to the innumerable sights she had been receiving, composed them into something tolerable, comprehensible. Yes, she thought, heaving a deep sigh of relief as she turned from the carpenter's shop to climb the hill, I can begin to live again. I am by the serpentine, she thought. The little boat is climbing through the white arch of a thousand depths. I am about to understand. Those were her words spoken quite distinctly. But we cannot conceal the fact that she was now a very indifferent witness to the truth of what was before her, and might easily have mistaken a sheep for a cow, or an old man called Smith for one who was called Jones and was no relation of his whatever. For the shadow of faintness which the thumb without a nail had cast had deepened now at the back of her brain, which is the part furthest from sight, into a pool where things dwell in darkness so deep that what they are we scarcely know. She now looked down into this pool or sea in which everything is reflected, and, indeed, some say that all our most violent passions, and art, and religion, are the reflections which we see in the dark hollow at the back of the head, 
when the visible world is obscured for the time. She looked there now, long, deeply, profoundly, and immediately the ferny path up the hill along which she was walking became not entirely a path but partly the serpentine. The hawthorn bushes were partly ladies and gentlemen sitting with card cases and gold-mounted canes. The sheep were partly tall Mayfair houses. Everything was partly something else, and each gained an odd, moving power from this union of itself and something not itself, so that with this mixture of truth and falsehood, her mind became like a forest in which things moved. Lights and shadows changed, and one thing became another. Except when Canute, the elk hound, chased a rabbit, and so reminded her that it must be about half past four, it was indeed twenty three minutes to six, she forgot the time. The ferny path led, with many turns and windings, higher and higher to the oak tree which stood on the top. The tree had grown bigger, sturdier, and more knotted since she had known it, somewhere about the year 1588, but it was still in the prime of life. The little sharply frilled leaves were still fluttering thickly on its branches. Flinging herself on the ground, she felt the bones of the tree running out like ribs from a spine this way and that beneath her. She liked to think that she was riding the back of the world. She liked to attach herself to something hard. As she flung herself down, a little square book bound in red cloth fell from the breast of her leather jacket, her poem, The Oak Tree. I should have brought a trowel, she reflected. The earth was so shallow over the roots that it seemed doubtful if she could do as she meant and bury the book here. Besides, the dogs would dig it up. No luck ever attends these symbolical celebrations, she thought. Perhaps it would be as well, then, to do without them. She had a little speech on the tip of her tongue, which she meant to speak over the book as she buried it. It was a copy of the first edition, signed by author and artist. I bury this as a tribute, she was going to have said, a return to the land of what the land has given me. But, Lord, once one began mouthing words aloud, how silly they sounded. She was reminded of old Green getting upon a platform the other day, comparing her with Milton, save for his blindness, and handing her a check for two hundred guineas. She had thought then of the oak tree here on its hill. And what has that got to do with this, she had wondered, what has praise and fame to do with poetry? What has seven editions, the book had already gone into no less, got to do with the value of it? Was not writing poetry a secret transaction, a voice answering a voice? So that all this chatter and praise and blame and meeting people who admired one and meeting people who did not admire one was as ill-suited as could be to the thing itself a voice answering a voice. What could have been more secret, she thought, more slow, and like the intercourse of lovers, than the stammering answer she had made all these years to the old crooning song of the woods, and the farms, and the brown horses standing at the gate neck to neck, and the smithy, and the kitchen, and the fields, so laboriously bearing wheat, turnips, grass, and the gardens blowing irises and fritillaries. So she let her book lie unburied and disheveled on the ground, and watched the vast view, varied like an ocean floor this evening with the sun lightening it, and the shadows darkening it. There was a village with a church tower among elm trees a grey-domed manor-house in a park, a spark of light burning on some glass-house, a farmyard with yellow corn-stacks. The fields were marked with black tree-clumps, and beyond the fields stretched long woodlands, and there was the gleam of a river, and then hills again. In the far distance Snowdon's crags broke white among the clouds. 
she saw the far Scottish hills and the wild tides that swirl about the Hebrides. She listened for the sound of gun firing out at sea. No, only the wind blew. There was no war today. Drake had gone. Nelson had gone. And that, she thought, letting her eyes, which had been looking at these far distances, drop once more to the land beneath her, was my land once. That castle between the downs was mine, and all that moor running almost to the sea was mine. Here the landscape, it must have been some trick of the fading light, shook itself, heaped itself, let all this encumbrance of houses, castles, and woods slide off its tent-shaped sides. The bare mountains of Turkey were before her. It was blazing noon. She looked straight at the baked hillside. Goats cropped the sandy tufts at her feet. An eagle soared above her. The raucous voice of old Rustam, the gypsy, croaked in her ears. What is your antiquity and your race and your possessions compared with this? What do you need with four hundred bedrooms and silver lids on all the dishes and housemaids dusting? At this moment, some church clock chimed in the valley. The tent-like landscape collapsed and fell. The present showered down upon her head once more, but now that the light was fading, gentlier than before, calling into view nothing detailed, nothing small, but only misty fields, lamps in cottage windows, the slumbering bulk of a wood, and a fan-shaped light pushing the darkness before it along some lane. Whether it had struck nine, ten, or eleven, she could not say. Night had come, night that she loved of all times, night in which the reflections in the dark pool of the mind shine more clearly than by day. It was not necessary to faint now in order to look deep into the darkness, where things shape themselves, and to see in the pool of the mind now Shakespeare, now a girl in Russian trousers, now a toy boat on the Serpentine, and then the Atlantic itself, where its storms in great waves past Cape Horn. There was her husband's brig, rising to the top of the wave. Up it went, and up, and up, the white arch of a thousand deaths rose before it. O oh, rash, O oh, ridiculous man, always sailing so uselessly round Cape Horn in the teeth of a gale. But the brig was through the arch and out on the other side. It was safe at last. Ecstasy, she cried, ecstasy. And then the wind sank, the waters grew calm and she saw the waves rippling peacefully in the moonlight. "'Marmaduke Bonthrop Shelmerdine!' she cried, standing by the oak tree. The beautiful, glittering name fell out of the sky like a steel-blue feather. She watched it fall, turning and twisting like a slow, falling arrow that cleaves the deep air beautifully. He was coming as he always came, in moments of dead calm, when the wave rippled and the spotted leaves fell slowly over her foot in the autumn woods, when the leopard was still, the moon was on the waters and nothing moved between sky and sea. It was then that he came. All was still now. It was near midnight. The moon rose slowly over the weald, its light raised a phantom castle upon earth. There stood the great house with all its windows robed in silver. Of wall or substance there was none. All was phantom. All was still. All was lit as for the coming of a dead queen. Gazing below her, Orlando saw dark plumes tossing in the courtyard, and torches flickering and shadows kneeling. A queen once more stepped from her chariot. "'The house is at your service, ma'am,' she cried, curtsying deeply. "'Nothing has been changed. 
The dead Lord, my Father, shall lead you in. Immediately the first stroke of midnight sounded. The cold breeze of the present brushed her face with its little breath of fear. She looked anxiously into the sky. It was dark with clouds now. The wind roared in her ears. But in the roar of the wind she heard the roar of an aeroplane coming nearer and nearer. Hear! Shell, hear! she cried, bearing her breast to the moon, which now showed bright so that her pearls glowed like the eggs of some vast moon spider. The aeroplane rushed out of the clouds and stood over her head. It hovered above her. Her pearls burnt like a phosphorescent flare in the darkness. And as Shelmerdine, now grown a fine sea captain, hale, fresh-colored and alert, leapt to the ground, there sprang up over his head a single wild bird. It is the goose, Orlando cried, the wild goose. And the twelfth stroke of midnight sounded. The twelfth stroke of midnight, Thursday, the 11th of October, 1928. End of section 11. Read by Nicole J. LaBeouf, Boulder, Colorado, USA. April 1st, 2024. End of Orlando, a Biography by Virginia Woolf.